All right, so maybe I'll get started. Um, given that it's post lunch, so in some sense it's not um, civilized enough to start on time. But at the same time, hopefully, first few minutes we'll spend time uh, just doing introductions. So it won't be a big of a loss. So let me start by uh, introducing myself. I'm Devavrat Shah. I'm a professor in electrical engineering and computer science department. And I'm going to do this tutorial uh, with. Uh, Okay, well, first of all, uh, thank you for coming and uh, welcome. Uh, the topic of the tutorial is what do we, where we means uh, we as a community, not we as Christina and myself. Uh, we as a community know about uh, the topic of matrix estimation. Um, uh, hopefully this will be as much unbiased and survey-like uh, tutorial to the extent possible, but of course, one of the reasons we are excited about this topic uh, because we have been thinking about this uh, topic for a while and so there'll be aspects of the tutorial that will be somewhat biased and you will pardon us for that. Uh, why do we do this tutorial or why are we interested in doing this tutorial? So there are a few reasons. Uh, first and foremost, uh, let me ask you questions. Many of you do look like students and many of you do look like uh, professors, lecturers, instructors. So either as a student or as an instructor, uh, how many of you have taken any form of machine learning class or listened or followed? I would say just other than sort of those who are not raising their hands, most of you have done it. And um, if you have done that how in those lectures uh, or that those classes like the way I do it, uh, most likely you have learned something about matrix completion recommendation system. Is that a fair assumption? Okay, reasonable number of head, head shakes saying yes. Um, and most likely it's taught as lecture number 23 or 24 out of 24 lecture course, which is, it's a great miscellaneous topic. The purpose of this tutorial is to argue that, well, actually, uh, yes, it was a miscellaneous maybe eight or 10 years back. I think it has become an important topic for us to think about as a first class citizen rather than a miscellaneous second class citizen in the world of, uh, let's say, a modern statistics or machine learning. And that is one hope that uh, we have, at least we would like to make that case through this tutorial, so that's one. Two, uh, uh, my second affiliation that I've listed that Select, it's a company I founded uh, roughly five years back, uh, and I was on leave for that for close to three and a half years. Um, got back to teaching a uh, year plus back. And at their company, it's a machine learning startup, and I am happy to dis discuss with you offline about what we do there. We spent uh, uh, building a software infrastructure for prediction problems and their matrix estimation, though it looks like caricature if you know it, it is the cog of a large uh, system and it's very effective, very robust. So I feel that sort of practically it's super useful. So one should definitely know that. And the last but not the least, uh, we as an information theory community primarily think about uh, estimation questions, and these are the right sorts of uh, estimation questions where information theory and computer science and algorithms and machine learning come together very nicely. So if you're not already thinking about some of these things, you would uh, think about that. So with those things, let me get started. I've given you enough time to copy those last six uh, uh, alphabets in case you have not done. That's where all the slides of the tutorial are. And if you are going to copy it, those were your 10 seconds. All right, so with that, here is the agenda for the tutorial. Uh, it's divided into roughly three parts. Uh, first two parts being the chunk of it, and then the last part being uh, the last piece of it. Um, in the first part, which primarily I will talk about, uh, I will start with just a formal definition of matrix estimation through an example. We'll define it uh, through a formal model, understand what sorts of, what are the goals, what is the problem statement. And then I will spend time describing variety of applications from variety of angles. Some of them are obvious and natural that you might have seen, and some of them hopefully you'll find unusual and surprising. Uh, then I will talk about overview of algorithms that variety of folks have looked, uh, have proposed coming from different uh, motivations. And then uh, one of those simplest algorithms called singular value thresholding, and I'll uh, walk through a basic analysis of that. Okay, so that's where we are going to get detailed. 
Now, break is, uh, this is the right type of break that we should have planned as far as the tutorial goes, but it makes sense to synchronize with the coffee break. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, instead of five minute break there, we'll take 10 minutes break. We won't have the second break, and that will coincide or overlap with the coffee, okay? And in case coffee comes a little late, feel free to walk in and walk, walk, uh, walk out and come in just quickly enough. The second part would be uh, uh, done by primarily Christina, which will talk about uh, convex relaxation. That's another class of methods. I'll talk about uh, non-parametric methods. Uh, it's like the mother of no all non-parametric method is nearest neighbors or kernel methods. And this is, uh, this is what got us into this topic. And so there'll be a, a somewhat biased overview of that aspect, but we'll sp uh, spend some time discussing that and connections to a popular algorithm called corroboratory filtering. And finally, uh, we'll discuss uh, matrix estimation as a case study for uh, utilizing non-convex methods for statistical estimation problems that are prevalent in both uh, things like matrix estimation, but also in neural networks. And then finally, what's beyond like uh, natural extension of matrices are tensors, uh, the type of noise models and so on and so forth. And of course, a new tutorial of this type in this day and age can be, in, can be complete without me mentioning neural networks, right? So I'll have one slide about neural networks as well. Okay, so with that, uh, let me get started. Again, it's um, not too large of a uh, room, uh, so feel free to interrupt at any point of time. Uh, the purpose is to communicate as much as we can really well rather than communicate everything that we have planned. Okay, so with that, let me get started. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the first part. Okay, so, so let's start with the simplest example that most, if not all of you have seen. This is just for the purpose of level set. So think of uh, a recommendation system like a portal like Netflix. And, um, you know, this is a caricature of the Netflix recommendation problem that is when a, new, a, a user logs on next time, what are the shows or movies that uh, Netflix should recommend that user might want to watch or see? And uh, one way to look at that is to say, well, these are the end users, and these are the movies that you have. And for a subset of users and movie pairs, we know user-movie interaction. In the simplest form, user-movie interaction is in the form of a user providing a rating for a movie. So for example, here, this says a user one has provided rating three to movie. Okay? But of course, given the, uh, given the dimensionality of the problem, like in the context of Netflix, there are, depending on whether you think about just continental United States or across the globe, there are between uh, tens of millions of users to hundreds of millions of users. And as far as number of shows are concerned, again, depending on whether you think about English speaking or not, uh, hundreds of thousands to millions. Okay? So, in that situation, this matrix is going to be extremely sparse, and one way to solve this uh, caricature problem is to say that, well, uh, for when user i logs in, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that um, for user i, all the movies that she or he has not rated, I'm going to compute their ra ratings, sort them, and provide the top three. Okay? Effectively, in a nutshell, question boils down to, for a given entry of a matrix, which is unfilled, let me fill that in based on all the other entries that I've observed. Okay. That's a basic question. Uh, just formalizing a little bit, we believe that there is a ground truth. There's a ground truth matrix A. We observe a noisy versions of these matrix. For example, we might not observe all entries IJs, which is, uh, it's a sparsely sampled. Second, if we observe an entry, we may, it may not be the ground truth, because your ground truth might be rating 3.7, and I'm only allowing you to rate into integers. Or maybe your mood was off, and because of that, sort of you created a noisy version. So in some sense, you have noisy observations of uh, ground truth, and hopefully it has something to do with the ground truth. And from this Y matrix, you want to reconstruct estimation of A, so that A is like A hat is close to A in some form. Okay, and as we'll go through, I'll sort of uh, parse more precisely the, the precise noise model and the, uh, the prediction error metric. Okay, so the first question one can ask is, what is an appropriate model? Because if you are thinking as an adversary, what I'll do is that for the entry that you have not observed or nobody has observed, you say it's 10 and I will say it's minus infinity. In fact, I need a, some structure on the A, otherwise you won't be able to do anything from partially observed matrix question is, what is the right model, or what is the right structure? Okay. Um, 
many of you would have looked at this question in past and you say, well, maybe it's a low rank is a reasonable way to think about it. And then there are all sorts of um, uh, justification one can provide why that is a reasonable thing. Let me, let's do sort of very simple uh, basic human uh, thought experiment before we sort of uh, um, resign ourselves to a stereotypical low rank model. Okay? So here is a thought experiment I want us to do. So let's say uh, you and I discuss this problem and you spend some time and you come up with this amazing algorithm. Let's call that algorithm ALG, okay? very innovative name. And now what I'll do is that I'm the tester, so I'm going to give you Y, which is this noisy version. You apply your ALG to that, and you give me A hat. Okay, so I gave you Y, you gave me A hat. Now I'm going to tell you that, hey, you know what, I'm going to give you another matrix and you fill it for me too. Okay? But the way I'm going to generate that matrix is as follows. I'm going to take Y, okay, and I'm going to permute some rows, I'm going to permute some columns. Okay? I'm going to give this to you. Let's call that permuted matrix pi of y. Okay? Now you apply the same alg to that. Okay? I'm, and you produce, let's say, b hat as your output. Question, is b hat the same as pi of a hat? That is, you take the a hat that you got because you applied algorithm to y, you permute exactly in the same way in which I permitted y to get b hat. Okay? Putting it other way, I'm asking you the following question, that does your algorithm utilize the fact that movie number 27 was called 27, and user number 2191 was called 2191? Okay, let me make it more dramatic. It was user number XYZ ABC. It's a hash. Okay? There is no information in the indices. Okay? Now, this is different from me telling you that in addition to the matrix, I'm telling you, well, this person is 30 years old and male. That's a separate thing. Here, we're simply focusing on availability of matrix, nothing more. Okay? So if I just have matrix, clearly no reasonable algorithm should be uh, utilizing the name or index value. It, is, it has to be permutation invariant in, in this sense. Okay. Now, if you... So that means this is a canonical uh, property that any such algorithm should have. Now, if you are a statistician and if you start thinking about a, a generative model, one way to think of generative model for the data is to say that, well, whatever the distribution that you have of this random variable or collection of random variables, this is matrix, so matrix is collection of random variables, that should be exchangeable or it should be row column exchangeable. That is. The joint distribution of these random variables under permuting rows or columns should not change. Okay? Like the classical version of this kind of exchangeable property was uh, what uh, a celebrated uh, result by definity in 1930s, which says that suppose I've got uh, infinite sequence of random variable x1, x2, xn, and if I permute any finite collection of them, the joint distribution of this entire sequence does not change. And as a consequence, there's a beautiful characterization theorem that he established, which effectively says that subject to prior, all such exchangeable distribution are like independent, uh, or IID. Okay. Similar, similar characterization led to characterization for higher dimensional arrays. In particular, this is a two-dimensional array. And there was, those are the collection of results by Hoover and Aldous in late 1970s, early 80s, which using this property and the fact leads to this canonical latent variable model. So what is this canonical latent variable model? It's a generative model for the data for this setting, where the idea is that uh, you are going to generate this random matrix yij as follows. For every row i and every column j, you're going to sample some latent feature. It's unobserved. Okay, it could be high dimensional. And these are sampled as per some fixed distribution. Okay, but for each row and each column, you go first go and sample your distribution. Once you have sampled your distribution, the way you're going to generate y is such that 
expectation of yij is equal to aij, where aij is just a latent function, some unknown but latent, so unknown hence, hence latent, but fixed measurable function applied to these row and column features. Okay, so let me just repeat the whole model. Again, okay. the way you would generate is for each row and each column, you're gonna sample latent features as per some fixed row distribution and column distribution from some latent space. Okay. Once you have got that, you have some latent function f, which is a measurable function. You apply that to row and column. That gives you aij, the ground truth matrix. And y is a random variable generated independently, a condition on these x's, of course, uh, such that in expectation, yij is equal to aij. Now, of course, one way to get this kind of setting is to say yij equals to aij plus iid zero mean noise, like a Gaussian with mean zero and variance one but it could be anything else. It could be generic distribution, and the distribution could change from index to index, as long as we retain the expectation. Okay? So those are the type of uh, noise models that we'll differentiate and all that. Now, when I say generic measurable function, that's a little too much. So the question would be that for what class of, what function classes can we recover these A's really well from a minimal observations? Okay. Or putting it other way, how does the function class complexity play a role in terms of amount of observations we need? Or what sorts of recovery we can achieve? And finally, going back to the low rank model, right? Uh, remember, let's say suppose rank is R, and let's suppose that these are just uh, R-dimensional, uh, let's say, R-dimensional Euclidean spaces. And F is nothing but X1 transpose X2. It's just a simple bilinear function. Then that's nothing but rank R model. Okay, so rank R model is just a special case of this. So is the setting clear? Okay, so we are going to assume that our data is generated like this. Um, okay, and what we want to do is we want to find A hat so that A hat is close to A. One standard measure that's studied is mean squared error as it's defined. It's natural, that is minimize the squared error on average across all entries and distribution, of course. And we want to minimize this by observing as little uh, number of observations as possible. So one thing I forgot to mention here is that we will observe yij each, or each ij with probability p independently. That's a uniform sampling model. And now, of course, one can ask the question, well, Maybe in reality, sampling models are not uniform. What will happen then? We'll come back to that. So hold on to that question, and hopefully in the last slide, we'll discuss that of the tutorial. Okay. All right, so we want to minimize this for as small a p as possible, as large a function class as possible, as generic uh, f domain of the features of latent um, uh, latent parameters as possible or latent features as possible. And again, as many different metrics as possible. I mean, this is a squared error, but it could be the max error, that is maximum across all IJs I want to minimize, or just minimize the squared error across rows and maximize across all, all rows, and variety of those things, uh, or pth norm, or whatnot. We will primarily focus on this thing, but many of the norms remain open, uh, and we can discuss that uh, as we go through. We may, we, may not okay. we may not remember that, so please feel free to ask questions around all of these things. Question, please. In the previous slides, um, was just, uh, just to make sure, uh, we're assuming that this is a To J, that's it. It cannot be affected also by the K or... No, exactly. So it, this is where it is. And the point is that, well, if you believed in this, or if you believed in this thought experiment, then this is a universal model. I mean... Yeah, so I mean... Okay. Unless that proves me wrong. Okay. Um, all right, so let's, uh, so, okay, so that's basically the setup of the question, and again, sort of, as, as we'll go forward, I'll, I'll peel more, uh, uh, more of the onion about the more details and so on and so forth. But with this, let's uh, spend some time going through a variety of applications, some, again, natural, obvious, some not so obvious. Okay. 
So uh, here is uh, one example of matching market. Yes. So I have a question about the environment. So you wanted the algorithm to be robust to permutations of the matrix A. So if the algorithm itself randomly sampled, permutes the matrix before applying itself, wouldn't it just be robust when you do Absolutely. In some sense, uh, it's your algorithm, uh, whether I give you Y or I give you permitted version of Y, it should provide the same answers. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're utilizing the index information. Yeah. Perfect. So the question was, uh, the question was that uh, algorithm should be robust to permutations and answer is yes. Okay. Next time I'll be a little bit more full form. <laughs> Okay, so let's start with the simple example of a matching market. So um, here is one, uh, one interesting app. It's uh, called Poshmark. How many of you know about it? Poshmark, nobody? Okay, great, it's an education. Um, uh, okay, so here's what happens in Poshmark. Let's say you are um, your person with, uh, with all sorts of really nice uh, 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 accessories like uh, Prada shoes. Uh, seems like none of you have, neither do I, um, or things like that, okay? And you, you, you have owned it for a while, these are expensive things, you used it maybe tens or twenties of times because they're expensive things, you've maintained them really well and now you want to sell them, okay? How do you do that? Well, you can take a picture and post it and say, this is the amount of money I'm going to charge. And Poshmark has like uh, tens to hundreds of millions of users. Okay, so who buys it? Well, somebody else buys it, okay? Now let's say I'm a somebody else as a prospective buyer. I log on to my app once in a while and I see what's coming up. And now, well, there are millions of things that are getting sold. So which one should I see? It's like an eBay problem effectively. Which one should I see? So I need some recommendation system, okay? And now interesting thing is that whenever you are selling something, you're selling it before it's sold, you never sold it. And after you sold it, you will never sell it, right? So it's kind of, it never gets repeated. Nobody watches the same movie again. Okay, so it's a kind of, it's about people. Like, what are the pairs of people who are likely to purchase things between each other? And let's say, imagine this is a caricature of that matrix that is these two people, unlikely pictures, but these two paper, people have per, uh, done transaction thrice. Now I'm asking a question, well, what is the likelihood that this person is gonna purchase from this person or vice versa? Again, unlikely, but still. That's a question I'm asking. That's a matrix, that's a question I'm trying to fill in. And again, this uh, model right is exactly the latent variable model. And solving that ability to estimate these things from these kind of noisy things is uh, about solving a matrix estimation problem. This is a variation of this would show up when you're thinking of matching riders to drivers in the context of Uber or Lyft. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So this is a whole world of matching markets. This is where it is. Let's go to the uh, a neighbor of this. Um, okay, so that's where it is. A neighbor of this is uh, what I would call social network. So again, so if it's a matching market was a social network primarily for the purpose of transactions, but think of LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a, a setup where people are connected with each other, which means you know who are connected and people you know who are not connected. So you have an adjacency graph. So that these are the people, same set of people and same set of other people. And this says that these two people are connected and so on and so forth. And now every time, I don't know how many of you use LinkedIn, but roughly speaking, LinkedIn tells you that, well, here are the set of people you want to get connected to. Well, the question you are asking is, what is the likelihood for this person who is not connected to, well, this person who is not connected to this person, what is the likelihood that they're two being connected? And then based on those likelihood estimation, you want to figure out what is the, who is the most likely to connect, et cetera, and then use that to do recommendation, okay? Now, again, this is uh, like uh, graphon estimation. So graphons are really nice, uh, uh, if, you, if you've not heard about them. Graphons are effectively an asymptotic characterization for dense graphs, and there is a, uh, a exactly same uh, uh, model as the latent variable model that we described. It's just symmetric because the X1s and X2 are the same because they're the same sets of people. And probability that two pair of people are connected is the function applied to the latent features of person I and person J. Okay? 
And that's the probability you observe the 0, 1. Expectation of any of these random variables, which is 0, 1, is exactly pij. OK, so it's kind of a very hard noise model. It's not a nice additive model. It's a 0, 1. And based on that, you want to estimate what is a pij. So putting it other way, I give you one instance of a graph between n things. And from there, I'm asking you a question. Go find me for every pair of nodes, connected or not, what is the probability that they are likely to connect? Okay. One instance. So it's an interestingly hard question. And again, that falls into this. Okay. So that's another question. In a sense, uh, uh, most of the work that happened in the world of network science has a very nice connection to many of these things happening here. Uh, moving on to a variation of this, which has uh, received reasonable attention in the information theory community, is a community detection or stochastic block model. Effectively, stochastic block model is a special case of graphon estimation where PIJs have a block structure. In particular, let's say there are two communities, communities of these reds and grays. And in one simple uh, model, people within community connect with each other with probability P. People not within community connect with probability Q with P greater than Q. Okay? And from, again, these 0, 1 connections, what you want to find out is that, well, what are the communities? Or as an intermediate step, which is a much more refined question, is that tell me the estimate for each pair of IJs. And once you have those IJs, maybe I can use that to do further processing to get communities. Okay? And again, so if you can actually find, solve the matrix estimation problem, you're in a fat city. Okay, so that's uh, another uh, example. Now, moving on to a little bit more uh, unfamiliar territory. Uh, in a sense, as matrix estimation questions were getting uh, lots of uh, interesting attention, a variety of exciting algorithms were being developed, especially from optimization perspective. Uh, personally, I was excited about questions coming from more uh, a social setting where one of the questions was ranking. And I, at that time, my thought was, well, the rankings have nothing to do with matrix, matrix estimation. Okay, and matrix, nobody cared about ma ranking from matrix estimation. Turns out they're exactly the same question. So let me describe this uh, simply. So let's say, again, same sets of people. Again, these are beautiful caricatures which I stole from Christina. Uh, let's say these numbers are representing the following thing. All of these guys are meeting in a... Uh, a meeting in a park where there's a chess board, and every time they uh, play game of chess with each other, what I'm recording here is that this person won twice with this against this person, and so on, right? Really, I believe that underlying model should be, there should be some probability with which a player I wins against player J, okay? Putting it in the uh, current context, if it's a soccer World Cup going on, a pair of teams are playing, what is the likelihood that uh, Argentina winning again against Iceland? Well, there was a very high chance, but then what happened? Who, who knows, right? Okay, so, but uh, you get this pairwise comparison data, and then from there, what you really want to do is that for any pair of users or any pair of individuals, you want to find out what is the likelihood that when she plays against him, her likelihood of winning. Okay? And again, uh, under a variety of... Uh, um, a variety of parametric models that are popular out there, like multinomial logit model and so on, Thurston's models and a variety of other things, this turns out to be, again, a special instance of matrix estimation question. Okay. So again, if you can have a great matrix estimation algorithm, you could potentially find out these likelihoods precisely for every pair, and then use that to potentially do further processing to find out some form of ranking or whatnot. Okay. So again, in that case, matrix estimation becomes an important intermediate step towards final process. Okay. Let me do one more example, which is very much like that. Crowdsourcing. Um, this is uh, what I would call micro-task crowdsourcing, uh, uh, introduced in uh, one of the models by David and Skeen in the 1970s for the context of uh, uh, taking a patient histories, where the idea was that um, you know, if you're a patient, if you're in a hospital, if you, I hope you, none of you have ever been, but if you have ever been, uh, this is roughly how it goes. You wake up in the morning and you are in pain and you're sort of annoyed and so on and so forth. First, really young, especially in academic hospitals, a really young um, 
a resident comes to you and asks you for history and asks you what's your pain, you will say, well, pretty high. Then you get your nice breakfast and uh, then the fellow comes around and you say, oh, okay, actually it's much nicer. And now you're bored and there's a whole the doctor comes and rounds with the whole team again and say, I'm bored, I might, I, let me increase my pain a little bit. Now you, looking at this data, trying to figure out what is real pain of this patient. It's like same as saying that, well, here are the set of web websites and here are the set of people, I'm asking those people, is this website suitable for children or not? Some say yes, some say no. How do I put things to, two things together in an unsupervised manner? And uh, the whole question boils down to effectively um, in a variety of, again, parametric models for this problem. The likelihood of uh, uh, somebody answering correctly a given task can be viewed as a simple low rank matrix estimation problem. Okay, so again, you've got zeros and ones. From that, you want to recover the likelihood of each person answering a given task correctly or not. And from there, you want to put all of the things together to figure out what is, the, is this suitable for children or not. And again, here, matrix estimation would be a nice intermediate step. Okay. All right, I'm, I know I'm sort of boring you, so I'm going to sort of move to a little bit more interesting uh, sort of examples. Here was a question that was uh, very interesting and exciting uh, in early 2000s, um, especially when sensor networks were becoming of interest, uh, where people have sensors, noisy sensors, and based on that you have, let's say, uh, n things that are there and only pairwise distances are available, maybe noisy versions of them, and from there you want to do embedding of these things in a Euclidean space. Turns out, that pairwise distance matrix, if it's, uh, these things are in um, uh, Euclidean space D, is actually a rank D uh, uh, PSD, or minus of that is rank D PSD. Okay? And again, for that reason, it's a special case of, again, matrix estimation. You solve it using matrix estimation, you get embedding, and so on and so forth. All right, moving on. Um, uh, here's something uh, which is uh, close to my heart, uh, especially right now, and this is called uh, using matrix est estimation for causal inference. So how does this work? So let's consider a following example. Let's say that uh, you want to figure out whether gun control is a good thing or not. Okay, you and I can debate at, uh, forever, and you know, that's one way to come to a conclusion. Another way to come to a conclusion is to actually do it in data-driven manner. So for that reason, let's say that we decide and convince New York State to impose gun control in New York State. A year goes by and crime rate goes up. And now skeptics of gun control would say, I told you so, actually it doesn't work. Okay. An alternative scenario, a year goes by, crime rate goes down. Skeptics will say, I told you it is going down because economy got better. There's no way you can win the argument, right? Now, this is exactly the problem you come across when you're trying to design a drug, right? So what do you do? You do randomized control. You say, well, here's 100 patients. I'm going to randomly choose 50, give them drug, randomly choose 50, the rest of the 50, I don't give them a drug. And then after some time, I see whether patients have gotten better or not with the drug. OK, so let's do that in New York State, right? Let's create two New York State. OK, there's a problem. So what do you do? Well. Uh, uh, econometricians uh, have been looking at this question forever, and the, one of the things that they came up with was the idea was what's called synthetic control, where the idea was, well, look, New York State maybe looks 80% like, uh, like uh, Chicago, sorry, 80% like Illinois, and 20% like uh, California. So maybe what we should do is uh, not intervene California and uh, Illinois, and then see what happens there, and compare it with uh, what happens in New York. But actually, there is a much better way to look at those things rather than doing that expert-driven way, is to put the metric that you care about, like, Chicago, uh, like Illinois, San Francisco, and so on, and their measurement across time as rows, and the thing that you care about, that is your target, as this target row, and you're looking at this matrix, and really all you're saying is that this matrix has some form of a factor model, which is what econometricians call it, or which is just a rank two latent variable model, and now do matrix estimation, do the robust version of this, use that to learn the linear relationship, and then use that to do extrapolation. Now, uh, that works really well, and if you don't believe, I don't know how many of you believe in cricket as an interesting sport, but if you do believe, 
this is, uh, this is what we are using right now to actually design uh, something called a Duckworth-Lewis method for our variation of Duckworth-Lewis for cricket, and it works beautifully. And happy to talk to you offline if you're a cricket fan. But I know most of you are not, so let's continue. Uh, one last thing is um, the matrix estimation method in, in disguise through Hankel matrices and all that did appear historically in the context of um, uh, system identification and control. Uh, but there is, uh, at least you look at, you take a renewed look at it through latent variable model, and actually most uh, time series model that you can think about, like harmonics, uh, the ARIMAs, or uh, LTIs, or um, uh, the, uh, the non-stationary model like uh, polynomials, all of them uh, can be viewed as actually a lens of matrix estimation. Okay, so putting it other way, if you want to do time series forecasting, Okay, time series imputation, let's say missing value or forecasting, you can actually use matrix estimation as a nice black box. And roughly it would look like this. This is your time series. Choose your favorite time series, let's say temperature or the stock price or whatnot. Take your favorite parameter called L. Divide your time series into these blocks. Make each of these blocks a column of a matrix like this. Do matrix estimation for this and fill in the, fill in the missing values. And that's it. And that will work really, really well. Okay. All right. So I think I, uh, I hopefully uh, appetized you enough that why you should sit through remaining uh, uh, two hours and twenty minutes, of course, with breaks uh, for this uh, through this tutorial, and hopefully something interesting will happen. Question, please. Uh, so when you were talking about matrix estimation with the social network, uh, did it assume that it was a symmetrical matrix? In other words, if I had a relationship with you, we would both uh, rate the relationship the same value? Good. So um, in the example I was describing, yes, I assumed it was symmetric. But in generic matrix estimation, it's, it's not necessarily symmetric. Yeah. So uh, symmetric is a nice uh, setup to consider. And uh, there are nice reductions between these two models as well. Okay. Other questions? All right, so what have I done so far? Um, I have primarily told you about uh, what the problem of matrix estimation is, why it is interesting, a variety of applications. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a, at least overview, a uh, very high level overview of the class of algorithms that are out there. And then after that, we'll slowly start going through the details of the algorithms in terms of what do we know about these algorithms. Okay? And uh, we'll try to primarily focus our uh, uh, exposition towards uh, what do we know analytically about these algorithms. Uh, but of course, there is a lot more that we don't know that uh, works well in practice, but why it's working. Okay? And we'll, given, the, uh, given the audience and given the context, we won't spend much time discussing that. Okay. Right, so with that, uh, just to quickly recall, right? Ground truth matrix, noisy observations with partially observed things. Noise is such that expectation is always ground truth. And we want to produce A hat so that A hat and A are close to each other. Okay? This is all that's out there, roughly speaking. Okay? So at least the good news is that it can all fit into one slide at uh, uh, 10,000 feet. So let me parse that. So there are roughly uh, three types of algorithms. Uh, one is just very basic matrix factorization. Second is, comes from uh, looking at the optimization view of statistical problem, and then there are variations in that, which is the convex relaxations, or looking at the problem as a non-convex problem and then just tackling it directly. Okay? So those will be, those are the two approaches. And then finally, uh, a, a non-parametric approach, uh, because at the end of the day, this is statistical estimation, so it deserves to have a non-parametric approach. And especially when you look at from the lens of this uh, latent variable model, this makes a lot more sense. And their uh, nearest neighbors is the mother of all, as I said, mother of all non-parametric methods. Question is that what is the right uh, nearest neighbor here? It's not so obvious, and that's where um, uh, that's where we got super excited about it. And interestingly, there is a class of algorithms called corroboratory filtering that everybody uses in practice, uh, and uh, it works of wonders. Question is that why? It turns out this algorithm and non-parametric representation is very tight connection, and that's what we'll go through. Okay, so those are the 
set of approaches that we want to spend this spend time discussing. Okay, we'll talk about how do people go about analyzing this class of algorithms. What are these algorithms? How do we people spend time analyzing these algorithms? How do what are these algorithms? How do people spend time analyzing that, and so on and so forth, and for each one of them. Okay, so hopefully we'll be able to do reasonable justice to all of these things in um, uh, whatever time remains. All right, so first algorithm, matrix factorization. So again, at the end of the day, you got a matrix. See, even though it's noisy, it's a matrix. So you can do matrix factorization. You can do singular value decomposition. Uh, the way you would do it is you have matrix Y that you have observed. Replace all unobserved entries by zeros or something else. But let's say for this tutorial, we'll always think it's replaced by zero. Then you take that matrix, do it singular value decomposition. Okay, everybody can do that. Then what you do is that you keep the singular vectors and singular values that are large enough, that are larger than some threshold. Okay? The rest you throw out. You say, well, that's noise. Okay? And then just keep it as is, and then maybe pre-multiply it by some constant because of just throwing things out. Okay? So it's like a primarily it's just singular value decomposition with truncation and rescaling. And that's it. That's your algorithm. And that's my A hat. Okay. It's as simple as it gets. Okay. So take the Y, which is noisy Y, replace missing values by zeros, take the singular value decomposition, truncate it, pre multiply by some constant. And I'll describe uh, the choices of thresholds and the uh, constants as we go forward. But that's roughly what it is. Any questions? Just once. Surprisingly, it will have a pretty interesting properties. Okay, so with that, so it was algorithm one. Okay, now second algorithm or second class of algorithms come from viewing a statistical problems or statistical estimation as an optimization problem. One way to think of uh, statistical estimation as an optimization is, well, you want to minimize some notion of risk over the choice of model parameters that you're trying to learn. Okay, and this risk might actually capture uh, things like uh, uh, error between the ground truth and the observation. That is, you want to minimize that loss. So it could be loss, or it could be model complexity. The way I'm, I've written down, or combination of that, the way I've written down here is that, well, this is roughly where loss lives. And this is where model complexity lives. Okay. So the question is, that what is the model complexity? Well, as I'm, we have mentioned many times already, one of the popular, popular notion of model complexity is rank. That is, let me f I observed y. Let me find z, such that z is close to y in some form. I don't want it to be too far. But while I'm doing this, I want to find z such that it has low rank is as low rank as possible, okay? And uh, that's one type of problem. Okay. The issue with that is that rank is not easy to minimize. There's minimizing rank. This is a hard problem. So question is that what should one do? And this is where people try to do uh, relaxations. Say, so, well, this is a hard objective. Let's, let's relax it by its tightest, tightest convex relaxation. And it turns out its tightest, tightest convex relaxation is nuclear norm of the matrix rather than the rank, uh, which is, so if you have a matrix like this, the nuclear norm is nothing but sum of its singular values. Okay. And uh, if you know this, then you would know that this has natural connection to compressed sensing. That is, this was L1 minimization equivalent for L0 minimization. Okay, so rank minimization is L0, uh, L1 minimization is nuclear norm minimization. So putting it other way, convex relaxation of this, the convex objective or convex optimization take on this question would be, given observations, find matrix Z that has as small nuclear norm as possible while close to being the observations on the things that you observed. Okay. And uh, this turns out to be equivalent to the following uh, semi-raphinoid optimization. It looks somewhat, um, somewhat convoluted. First is uh, if you squint enough that you will realize that this is indeed a semi-raphinoid uh, optimization. And semi-raphinoid optimization is a nice class of convex optimizations. That, that's good. It's got great interior point method, which naturally known barrier functions or 
uh, that allows you to sort of have very efficient methods, at least efficient in polynomial sense. And then uh, uh, where does this really come from? If you have not seen this before, really, one way to think of um, a nuclear norm of a matrix, you can think of its variational form. Its variational form would be effectively minimization over Ws while keeping Z fixed. And now you're adding constraints, so that's a very nice uh, coincidence that variational form naturally leads to this nice convex uh, uh, optimization. Okay. All right, so again, if you want to sort of know where this comes from, just, just go track down the variational form of nuclear norm. So with that, it's, it's uh, easy to solve. The question is that how well does this recover? And that's the type of statistical question we'll ask. The another approach is to say, well, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do convex relaxation. Uh, I just want to go and solve the problem directly. Well, one way to solve the problem directly is to say, let me first posit that my underlying model has rank R. Okay, and of course, I can sort of iterate over all possible ranks and then later decide what I want to do. How many ranks can there be? Linearly many. So, well, you know, up to polynomials, at least for the purpose of as a theoretician, who cares? I'm going to just solve n problems in parallel. But let's say sort of you know what the rank is, then uh, effectively you're solving this minimization problem. This is a nice quadratic minimization problem. It's nice because it looks nice. It's not so nice because it's not convex. Okay? And uh, so the question is what do you do? Well, in practice, here's what people do. Say, well, look, um, I can actually just consider half of this problem, where let's assume for a second Vs are fixed and all I need to do is find Us. Is my, uh, let's say column singular vectors are known. I don't know the row singular vectors. Well, then if I look at just one particular row, let's say I, it boils down to solving this problem. And this problem effectively says, that, well, this is observed. I know this is fixed, so this is observed. So it almost looks, not almost, it is exactly like a linear regression or, or ordinary least square problems. And ordinary least square problems, we all know how to solve it in closed form. So that means if you give me Vs, I know how to solve for Us. Now I found Us, you go and find Vs, like expectation maximization or alternative least squared style algorithm. And that's exactly what the algorithm is. And again, if you are a practitioner, you would swear by it. This works really well in practice. Okay, and uh, people are slowly uh, figuring out why this might be working well in practice. All right, so that's um, uh, uh, one way to solve that non-convex problem. The way, at least uh, historically, the analysis went um, is uh, looking at uh, the following. It says, well, look, another class of algorithms are like a gradient descent algorithm. I'm not going to spell it out, but roughly gradient descent was a really nice form in this case. Write down gradient descent. And what you do is as follows. You do a hybrid algorithm. The hybrid algorithm would work as follows. You start with uh, your original matrix, and from there, uh, observations, from there you get a really good initialization, like do matrix factorization that we discussed. From that great initialization, you would apply maybe alternative least square or gradient descent or variation of that kind of algorithm to actually get even better. Okay, and hopefully, these two things to put together would actually do better than what just truncated SVD did. Okay? And that's roughly what uh, hybrid algorithms do. And now, recently, people have found is that at least under special, uh, special enough condition, actually, you don't even need to do this initialization. You just start by gradient descent and look for local minima, and local minima are good enough. So hopefully, if uh, Christina and, uh, and I keep on time, then we'll actually, near the end of the, uh, end of the tutorial, we'll discuss this part as well. All right, okay. Uh, finally, the last class of algorithms that we'll discuss is uh, nearest neighbors, or what are known as collaborative filtering. It's a very intuitive algorithm, and there was a reason why as soon as uh, people had e-commerce, people designed this algorithm. I mean, when you have e-commerce and you have a system running, you need an algorithm. I mean, you can't sort of wait for theoreticians to figure out what to do, right? So this is what the algorithm that people came up with, it's collaborative filtering. Uh, earliest references in Goldberg et al. in 92. Um, and the idea is following. Well, look, I want to figure out whether I should watch uh, Goodfellas or not. Okay, I've not watched it. Well, I've watched Godfather, 
And uh, based on my knowing Christina, she and I have good movie similar good uh, movie taste. And she has watched Godfather and Goodfellas, and she really liked Goodfellas. So maybe I should watch Goodfellas. Okay? It's like a very human thing. Okay? So it's like, that's called user-user collaborative filtering or putting it other way in the matrix form. I want to figure this out. Well, I'm going to find out another user who has overlapped with me in terms of things that I have watched and uh, rated. And they look very similar. And this user in particular also has rated the movie that I want to know. So I'll just go to transport that person's uh, rating. Okay. Now, of course, in practice, you won't do this. You will find a variety of different uh, multiple nearest neighbors, maybe do weighted averaging and so on and so forth. But that's, this is the gist of it. Now you look at this and you say, well, what's so great about rows? I can do columns too. Okay? There's nothing, nothing special about rows. So why don't we do columns? Okay? That is, I want to f fill this entry in this column. Uh, let me find other column which has some overlap and then also has entry in that row and then just transport it. And that's item item. Okay, and combination of these and variety of different things that people use in practice, but this in a nutshell is what is collaborative filtering. And now you look at this and you say, okay, what does this have to do with nearest neighbors? Look, uh, if you remember nearest neighbor, roughly idea is the following. I've got, I've got a function f of my interest, which is unknown. I observed feature x. I want to predict or estimate f of x. I know x, but I don't know f of x. What I'm going to do, I'm going to find x1, x2, x3 that I observed that are close to x. I've also known f of x1, f of x2, f of x3. So I'm going to take f of x1 plus f of x2 plus f of x3 divided by 3, and that might be my good estimation. The problem is that for user, I don't have features. It's a user index. And remember, as a part of our thought experiment, there's, let's not use indices. So how do I get nearest neighbor? Turns out that this type of collaborative filtering is actually doing something like that implicitly. Okay, and that will be the crux of uh, the presentation when we get to this uh, in the later part of the tutorial. Okay. All right. And these are, again, the reasons why I'm a big fan of collaborative filtering and its variations is uh, people use in practice. We used it very heavily in practice. It has got interpretation, as I mentioned. It's incremental. If you build it at scale, it has got are very nice connections to what people in computer science, especially in computer science, uh, where there are things called approximate nearest neighbor indices, uh, nice connections to computational geometry there. And of course, it has a relationship to the mother of all things. All right, so with that, that was the end of the uh, first part where we discussed the problem, the statement, uh, variety of applications, and uh, 10,000 feet overview of algorithms. Any questions before I proceed and uh, talk about the analysis of uh, the simplest possible algorithm. Okay, wonderful. All right, so I'm going to talk about how do we analyze singular value thresholding, okay? And uh, mm, surprisingly very simple. Okay. So let's just quickly recall, again, ground truth matrix, our observations such that expectation of each entry is the ground truth. Okay. Let me give you a little bit more detail because now we're going to do a little bit more precise analysis. Remember we had a latent uh, function or which was measurable function. I'm going to focus on two class of functions. One is just low rank setting, which is saying that F looks like this. And these are my feature space, which is uh, rank R or dimension R, and a Lipschitz functions, that is, it's generic Lipschitz function with the same domain, but it has this kind of a property. Okay? All right. Uh, we'll assume there are two types of noise, that is Yij equals to ground truth plus, let's say, Iid zero min Gaussians. So everyone has Iid zero min with variance one. Or we'll consider generic uh, arbitrary noise. That is, for every ij, it is a different noise distribution. On one case, it could be 0, 1. Like, uh, um, like in the case of graphs, either I observe an edge or I don't observe an edge. 
or it could be additive or combination of all of that. Okay? And we don't know anything about this. And again, primary focus would be roughly two types of things, either approximate recovery, that is, find the scaling, minimal scaling of a number of observations that I need to have, or fraction of observations that I need to know, so that my mean squared estimator goes to zero, as mn scale, or with high enough probability, I recover the underlying matrix exactly. Okay? All right. All right, so this is roughly, just remember this two by two by two. Okay. Okay, so let's go back to our singular value thresholding, and here is a version of the algorithm that I'm going to describe called universal singular value thresholding. There are a variety of versions of this, and this specific version is because of uh, Chatterjee. Okay. Um, so again, the way algorithm works is, as before, take Y, replace missing values by zeros, do the singular value decomposition, okay? And then define threshold as follows. Uh, if ignore eta for a second. All it says is that, and let's say m equals to n, okay, just to keep things simple. Let's say dimensions are all the same. So you're saying that, look at all singular values that are larger than two times square root of n p, where p is the fraction of uh, her data that we observe, keep those uh, keep only those single, those components and rescale them by p hat, which is the fraction of data you observe. Okay, so this is my scaling and this is my threshold. Again, again, sort of, if somebody came and told you that, well, I know that this ij entry, not only that, but it belongs to minus three and 27, well, okay, so make sure that in case your, this estimator has things which are less than minus three or more than 27, project it back. But let's, we'll ignore that for a second. No. But uh, the point is that sort of known entries are also noisy versions of the A, right? Uh, going back to that, especially going back to the graph setting, right? Uh, I have observed that there is an edge between you and me. That doesn't mean that underlying model has probability one of connecting, right? Okay. All right, so any questions about the algorithm? Okay. All right, so now what we were, um, here's a theorem from Chatterjee which says that under reasonable conditions, effectively the MSC scales like, and let's fo uh, focus on for a second uh, uh, one of these numbers, let's say this one, scales like, um, the nuclear norm of ground truth matrix divided by these quantities, okay? This, ignore this, this is just a noise, let's say. This is a part of the tail bound and let's ignore that for a second. It's, this is what matters, okay? If you parse this more precisely, all it says is that nuclear norm of your matrix should be less than, no, should not be scaling faster than square root of mn. All right, let's see, um, let's say m equals to n again, just to, just to put this in perspective and how nice this is. m equals to n, which means that all it says is nuclear norm should not scale faster than n. It should be small o of n. Now let's say sort of all singular values are same. Then your nuclear norm effectively scales like n, right? In general. Right? For any matrix, it scales like that. So all it says is that as long as it's scaling strictly less than n, you're going to be able to recover it reasonably well. Okay? Pretty impressive, right? Of course, that will require a different amount of observations and so on, but it's, it sort of applies for most of that setting. Okay? And again, the proof is simple, so I'm going to walk you through the proof. So this is one of those nice things where it's a simple algorithm, simple proof, okay? Of course, it doesn't give you strong guarantees because all it says is just uh, weak MSC guarantees. It doesn't utilize lots of uh, structural detail information, so it will it'll have its own pros and cons, and we'll discuss that as we go through other sets of algorithms. All right, so let's see. And hopefully in the next 10 to 15 minutes, I want to get to that, the rest of the proof. 
maybe 10 minutes, and they'll keep me perfectly on time. All right, so first of all, whenever I used p hat, I'm going to ignore that it's just p hat is equal to p because of simple Chernoff bar. I observe enough samples, so given I observed enough sample, I have a reasonably good estimate of what p hat should be. Okay, if any one of you don't like this, let's talk in the coffee break. So p hat is equal to p. All right, now, when, since I replaced missing entries by zero, really what I did is effectively I say that expected matrix looks like P times the ground truth matrix. Okay, all right, so that's fine too. And then what we're gonna do is that we're gonna establish this basic inequality, which says that the, the difference, okay, the spectral norm or the largest singular value of this difference matrix, that is y minus its expected matrix, does not scale faster than square root of mp. And remember, this was roughly the threshold we had. Okay? This was the threshold we had. So in some sense, what it's saying is that, well, this guy is close to this by this much. So that means that anything that is smaller than this, you can get rid of it. That's a noise. That's why you're doing this thresholding, okay? And that's where this number comes from, roughly speaking. All right, so then the question is, okay, why is this true? All right, well, this comes from a very uh, generic uh, lemma from uh, a random, a random matrix theory, and here's the simple lemma. Okay, so let's say n equals to m again. For the purpose of everything, I've written down precise uh, conditions, but for discussion, let's keep always n equals to m so that we're confused by fewer symbols. You see, I, I, I get confused by more than few symbols. Uh, let's say you got Q is a matrix such that each entry is generated independently. It's a zero mean. It has got bounded variance, okay? And it's a bounded domain. And let's say variance is large enough so that there's enough randomness. And then uh, what it says is that the this spectral norm of Q cannot be larger than the quantity we wanted to bound with high probability. Okay? It's like if you had, uh, roughly speaking, think of it this way. If you had a random matrix with uh, N by N uh, random matrix with IID Gaussian uh, entries, this is roughly what you would get. And this is a generic way of thinking about that. And now we have this, well, look, Y minus P, this, if this is Q matrix, for that Q matrix, we have all of these properties. It's just sigma is a different thing, but we have all of these properties, so when I put the right sets of values, I will get this answer immediately. Okay, and in sigma, P makes, uh, P makes its appearance, and that's why we have P, hat, P here. Okay, so that's basically why it's sufficient for us to argue that why this, in, this uh, lemma is true. All right, so let's prove this lemma. Sorry. Uh, why do we need lower bound for randomness? You will see. Good question. <laughs> you will see. Uh, and that's why we should look at the proof. Okay, so let's see how, do, how does one prove these kind of things. Well, um, two steps. First, we are going to say that the quantity that we want to uh, bound this is a very mm, tight concentration around this quantity, right? Because you've got sort of exponentially decay error. First, I want to say that this quantity has roughly expectation of this, uh, this type. And then I would say that that quantity concentrates around it, its expectation. So it'll be two steps. So first, let's get its expectation right. Okay, so why is this expectation right? Well, what we're trying to bound is uh, the largest singular value of this matrix. It's like if you think of, uh, let's say, n singular values, uh, let's say sigma 1, sigma n, you're trying to, it's a vector of length n, you're trying to bound the max value of that or L infinity norm of that. And then we know that sort of one way to bound L infinity norm of vector is to bound by, let's say, L2 norm of vector or LP norm of vector for any P, right? That's written down in matrix form is exactly this. So all this says is that sort of I do Lth power, I do 1 over 2L, there'll be 12th norm effectively of that thing with expectations and all that. And that means that all I need to do is that first bound this guy 
Now, again, these kind of things, if you had, uh, I'm sure sort of, if you had looked at things like MIMO stuff, uh, and, and analyzing MIMO channels, these type of inequalities played a major role then. That was the reason why ma random matrix theory was interesting at least a decade back in the communication context. And now let's say it's coming back in matrix. So things haven't changed. It's only problems have changed. Uh, inequalities haven't, unfortunately. All right, so coming back uh, to this, well, how do we write this? Well, trace is nothing but a sum of the entries on the diagonal. What is the sum of the entries on diagonal in uh, when you're taking, let's say, 12th power? Really, you're looking for a walk in the, um, uh, let's say, complete graph of n nodes, your walk of length 2L, where you're starting from node, let's say, I want, for this q to power 2L I11 entry, diagonal entry, can be thought of as your I1, I1 to go to I2, I2 to go through I3, dot, 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 I2L, and then come back to I1. So it's that kind of a loops. And then again, I'm sticking that expectation in. And this is for all possible I1s. So this gives me exactly this. Okay, so that's not a surprise. All right, now let's look at sort of all sorts of, uh, uh, in some sense, edges, right? I1, I2, I2, I3, and so on. What are their contributions? Let's suppose some edge is exactly occurring exactly once in this uh, thing. Well, then, because of independence, its expectation would live on its own. And in that case, expectation is zero, so that term will disappear. Which means that anything, any edge that's present that makes contribution to this must be present at least twice. Now, if it's more than twice, since I know that sort of the values of Q are bounded above by one in absolute value, is my assumption, I can just get rid of that. And now I'll just look at the square, but square is the variance which is bounded by sigma square. Putting all of that kind of things together, effectively I'll argue that if my loop, specific loop has exactly S distinct node visited in this graph, then it will be bounded above by sigma to power 2S minus two. So the only question that boils down to is how many of the loops here have, have exactly S distinct nodes in them? And whenever they have, I will put these bounds. It's a nice, simple calculation. Okay, not simple, nice calculation. We can do that, but somebody else has done it for us. Thank you. And that turns out a very nice uh, thing. Now again, if you know your Sterling's well and a little bit more, uh, or some kind of Laplace approximations well, then you can sort of simplify it, which is what he has done really well. And what he's shown is that as long as you keep L, okay, if you don't keep L larger than this, in particular, the largest L you keep is like this, then you can get this kind of a bound. Okay, so, okay. so there is a work here. If you're interested, it's a details, go look at it. But in a nutshell, you get this kind of a bound. And now, uh, what you really want is, look, this is nice and all that. You do the Jensen's and finally, this two to power n becomes like this. This is what you wanted. This you want as L or n goes to infinity, you want this to go to one. Now, this going to one is same as log of this going to zero. And if you do this simple calculation, this is where you get the lower bound on sigma square. And I think somebody asked a question about sigma square, right? And that's that. All right, so that's where the bound comes and that's where the log to power six. Putting everything together, you get that expectation of the spectral norm is how you want. Now, the last thing that's left is, let's show concentration. Okay, and once we did that, we are effectively done. Any questions? All right, great. So how do one show concentration? If you have looked at this, it's great. If you have not looked at this, this is a beautiful uh, tool. You should always remember and use it. So basically the step is that you get a generic concentration and uh, hopefully show that that generic concentration applies to your case. In this case, we're going to use uh, a simple uh, application of Telegram's inequality, which says that if you have a F, which is a convex Lipschitz function, then look at random variable y, which is applied to these random variables. M is the median of them, then y concentrates around median really nicely. Okay. Now, this also tells you that the variance of y cannot be larger than this. By Chebyshev's, this means that y and expectation of y cannot be away from each other by more than 16L for at least 75% of the chance. This tells you that the median must be sandwiched between these two numbers. 
which in turn implies that y minus e of y now, not the median, but y minus e of y, cannot be larger than t plus 16L by the same amount. Okay? Few steps. All we want to show is that now that a function that maps Q to its spectral norm, that function is convex in Lipschitz. Well, that follows directly from the matrix inequalities. Oh, sorry, uh, the, the metric or norm inequality. This is a triangle's inequality. Okay, so putting all of those two things together along with the previous slide, you get what you want. All right, fantastic. So what have we gotten? We have gotten that this is great. Now the question is that then why did we do truncation? Shouldn't we just stop there? It looks good. Well, there's a reason why we want to do truncation because this is bound in spectral norm, not in the MSC or Frobenius norm. MSC is like this in a Frobenius norm sense. Okay, and Frobenius norm we can bound by the spectral norm by a loss of R. Remember, Frobenius norm, uh, squared of Frobenius norm is sum of all singular values. This is just larger singular values. So larger singular value times number of singular value is a bound on that. Well, if R is small, that is rank of this is small, that's great, and that's the reason why we want to truncation. Okay, all right. Put everything together and use the, one of the nicer inequalities of, uh, and I, in my view, that's one of the, uh, that is the contribution of this Chatterjee's paper, which uh, provides this nicer way to bound, uh, do truncation in the, or equivalent inequality in the form of the, uh, the nuclear norm of matrix. And when you put that together, you get what you want. Okay. All right. So that's, uh, that's the end of the proof of why singular value thresholding works. Okay. And uh, just to summarize what you've seen so far, this is the part one. What we have gone is we've gone through algorithms, through function class, through noise model, the guarantee recovery, and uh, observation. And we're going to keep this scorecard. We'll keep populating this scorecard as we go along. Okay, why is this scorecard? Because this is our score. Smaller this is, better it is, okay? So what, we, uh, what the singular value thresholding does is that if you have a generic Lipschitz function, arbitrary noise, you can get MSC, and that requires scaling like this, which means that if you have R equals to one, roughly the number of samples you need are N raised to four by three. That is if you have the latent dimension of the features one. But if your latent dimension of feature is R which scales, then effectively you need N square as R becomes large. That means you're not really gaining anything. You roughly need to observe everything. Okay? On the other hand, uh, what you get for the low rank setting is you get NR times polylog. If you ignore polylog, this is the best you can do, and we'll, we'll look at one simple example for why that is the case. Okay? So just remember this, and I think this is a good time for us to take a break. Okay, so welcome back from the break. Um, um, in the second part, I'll be diving into the details of two classes of techniques. One will be that of convex relaxa relaxation techniques, and the second will be non-parametric nearest neighbor methods. And since Devra and I have spent a lot of time on looking at non-parametric nearest neighbor methods, I will actually start with those first, and we'll come back to convex relaxation in the second part of this section. So, um, so many of the early methods that were first used to approach or tackle matrix estimation assumed that the matrix was from a parametric family of function. In particular, low rank is probably the most common assumption that's used. Uh, but as Devrat set up in the introduction, we, we might want to ask if there are non-parametric methods uh, that can cover a much larger class of latent variable models. So to give a quick refresher of what these latent variable models are, and recall that they came from this nice property of exchangeability, uh, we assume that the rows are associated to latent variable alpha, which is sample IID from some underlying latent space that we don't know. And the columns are associated to some latent variable beta, which are also sampled IID from some unknown uh, underlying latent space. And we observe every entry independently with probability P, and given an observation, y sub ui, 
is going to be equal to some latent function f, a function of the row latent variable alpha and the column latent variable beta, plus some independent uh, noise. And we'll just start off by assuming that this noise is Gaussian, uh, but you can imagine other noise models as well. So if we actually observed the, these latent variables alpha and beta, then in fact we can apply classical non-parametric techniques, for example, nearest neighbor or kernel regression, where to predict the value of uh, the function f evaluated at row u and column i, what I might do is look for other rows that have similar features alpha to alpha u, and I look for other columns that have similar features beta to beta i, and then I will simply average over their data points and, uh, and, and use that to predict my, my output. But in this case, because the alphas and betas are actually latent, we want to ask, what can we do now? And uh, what, what are the class of models of this function, class f, for which we could actually have provable guarantees? So to start off with, we'll start with a very simple example. And we'll build up the algorithm from first principles. Suppose I want to estimate the value of y sub ui, and I observe these three other entries, y sub vj, yvi, and yuj. And for simpler notation, I'll just uh, assume that these latent variables associated to v and j are 0, and associated to u and i are alpha and beta. And let's assume for now that we just directly observe the exact function value with no noise. So what might I do uh, in this case? What I could try first is using a simple Taylor series expansion. Say I expand the uh, point uh, f of alpha u beta i around the point zero zero, and I would approximately get an equation like this, where I have the first derivatives of uh, the, the gradients of f uh, with respect to alpha and with respect to beta. Unfortunately, this doesn't actually help me solve the problem at all because I don't know how to compute these gradients. I don't even know what the function is, and I have no idea what alpha and beta are. So what do we do next? Uh, well, we have some other points here, so why don't we just try expanding these two other points on the corners also around the point 0, 0. So we can expand the function uh, evaluated at alpha 0 around 0, 0, and expand the function evaluated at point 0 beta also around 0, 0. And now we get a really nice uh, set of equations where you can see that here we have the first derivative with respect to alpha, here we have the first derivative with respect to beta. So we can subtract the second two equations from the first one and rearrange the expressions slightly such that we can get an equation uh, for our desired quantity as a function of these observed quantities. So that's nice. Um, of course, we recall that we don't exactly observe f itself. So instead of, instead of uh, uh, so we'll simply construct the estimator based on the observed noisy values y. And since our underlying true matrix was called A, I'll call the estimate A hat. So we can actually rewrite this estimate uh, in this way to, to, to uh, picture it a little better. So here we have our estimate for, for y sub ui is equal to yvj plus the purple quantity, which is yuj minus yvj. So the difference between uh, the, the uh, data points for, between these two rows and plus the difference between yvi and yvj, which is the difference between the data points between, uh, for, for these two columns. Uh, so this is nice, but we forgot one thing, which is that the approximation hinged on the fact that the, the latent variable parameters alpha for u and v were close, and the latent variable parameters for the columns beta i and beta j were close. And uh, we need this closeness in order to guarantee that the Taylor approximation is actually good. And this is uh, hard uh, to verify because we actually don't know what these features are. They're latent. So how do we go about figuring out if the alphas are close or the betas were close? And if you actually knew that to start off with, then we wouldn't have to do all this work. So what should we do now? Um, well, perhaps we can, instead of uh, looking for the true distance between the latent variables, let's look at the prediction error. So, the, so if you look at the, this estimator, yvj plus the purple quantity plus the green quantity, we can actually exactly look at the, the error in this estimate because the true value yui is equal to yvj plus the purple quantity plus this orange quantity. So yui equals yvj 
plus yuj minus yvj plus yui minus yuj. So really the error in, our, uh, in this little estimate is simply the difference between the interval in orange and the interval in green. So now, so now the goal is to ask, well, can I tell if two columns, if it's likely between two columns that all of the differences between, the, uh, between these two columns across many rows is approximately the same. And in fact, that is actually captured by the variance of the difference between these two columns across all rows. So you can actually see that the expected squared error of this estimate a hat minus yui, our target value, conditioned on the column latent features betas, is equal to the variance over a randomly chosen row. And recall that the, for every row, these alpha parameters were sampled IID. So it's equal to the variance for a randomly sampled latent row feature alpha of the difference between the ratings of these two columns. Similarly, I can condition on the rows and say the error of this estimate condition on the rows is equal to the variance of the difference between these rows across all the columns. So this actually gives us a nice and measurable quantity since we can actually uh, compute the empirical variances between the row differences or the column differences and use that uh, as a proxy for testing whether these rows and columns are actually close. So that suggests a simple algorithm in which we will approximate the distance between rows and columns uh, by computing the variance between variance of the difference between common observations. So for example, let's say I want to figure out what's the distance between rows V and row U. I look for all the columns for which row U and row V both have entries. I compute the difference, which is this delta, and then I compute the sample variance of these deltas, which is this quantity here, and I've denoted it DUV to, to denote that it's a measure of the distance. So now given this measure of distance, then the final estimate is simple and natural. Simply we average the data points from nearby rows and nearby columns. So here, this ball here is a neighborhood around uh, UIs where I'm looking for all rows V that have distance to U smaller than some threshold eta, and I'm looking for all columns J which have distance to column I less than or equal to some eta. And now for all the points within this ball, I simply average this estimator, which we, we call, we uh, derive from this Taylor series picture. So this is nice, and you might want to ask, how does this connect to the standard collaborative filtering from before that Devrat introduced in the introduction? So classical collaborative filtering also is based on computing similarities between overlapped entries. Uh, typically, though, uh, it uses only user-user, so it will compute just the, the distances between pairs of rows, or only look at distance between pairs of columns, and there's even extensive literature looking at is, is using user-user better or item-item better, depending on what settings. And um, the commonly used heuristic is cosine similarity, although there's other heuristics that have been explored. So something interesting about our basic estimate, so recall it looked like this, where we had something like the difference between the rows and the difference between the columns. And so it kind of combines the user, user, and item, item. So it combines the row differences and the column differences, as opposed to uh, only using one or the other. So not surprisingly, when you apply it to um, the data set movie lens um, to predict ratings, we actually saw that our algorithm uh, improves upon just using user, user, or item, item, collaborative filtering. And so, the perp so what we did, we, we selected a random percentage of the data set, we withheld it for the test set, used the remaining data to predict, and then test it on the withheld data set. And so um, the purple line is our method, the blue and the red line here is user, user, and item, item. And the yellow line on top is a soft impute, which is a singular value thresholding like method. So what just to point out, our method does improve upon user, user, and item, item, which seems intuitive from our uh, uh, discussion in the previous slide. And you do see that also as expected, as the data gets sparser, as you withhold more data, the mean squared error in increases. So now we want to take a pause and ask, well, this is a nice algorithm, but what kind of statistical properties does it have? And um, so we are in an information theory conference. So of course, we care a lot about the statistical efficiency as well. Um, so 
I'm going to present the um, results for a slightly modified, simpler algorithm, uh, just for easier teaching. So we'll, we'll look at a simpler algorithm. Instead of looking at the, the um, empirical variances between differences, let's just simply use the mean square difference. So let's say, again, to compute the difference distance between rows u and rows v, I look at all the common observations, all the columns that are common, and then I simply look at the average of the squared distances, differences. And uh, here I subtract a little bit, which is the variance of the additive error terms. And now given, again, this distance, we, the final estimate averages data points from nearby rows. So there's an intuitive way to understand uh, why does this have, potentially have nice analytical properties. And we can see that just by trying to visualize the function. So let's say here is alpha. Uh, alpha, recall, is the latent features associated to the rows. This axis is beta, which is the latent features associated to the columns. And the, this axis above is the function value, uh, the function as a uh, uh, function of alpha and beta. So I can imagine if I look at a single uh, column, I'm going to take a slice of the function in this hyperplane, and um, I can see wh where the function intersects. Uh, and this would be for a particular column, so for a particular column as a function of the latent feature of the row, what is the expected value of the data entry? And now if I look for this particular column, at two rows, let's say rows u and rows v, they will have some latent variable that lies on this axis. And they will be, you know, the in expectation, they will be concentrated around these uh, two points. And now again, I can slice this function along the other axis and look at, uh, for a fixed row, v, what is uh, the function associated to this row? And again, for the row u, what's the function associated to row v? And so now when I'm and when I'm fixing a pair of rows and looking at the difference between common entries uh, uh, for both rows, what I'm doing is I'm actually sampling this function uh, at the same point. So I'm actually intersecting now. I have a pair of functions here, and I'm taking intersections of this function on the beta axis multiple times. And it's sampled uniformly at random. So, uh, so, so then you can argue, and it's, it's intuitive to see from the picture, that the empirical, the empirical squared distance difference between uh, these set of points will approximate the L2 distance between these two functions. And that's exactly what the proof will show. So just to give you a sense of where we're going, what we're able to show is that if the latent function f is Lipschitz and bounded, and if the latent features are sampled uh, IID, and for simplicity, let's say they're sampled when the unit inter uh, uniform on the unit interval, but that can be relaxed. And if every entry is observed independently with probability p, and we have additive Gaussian noise with variance sigma squared, then we can actually pro provide this uh, bound on the mean squared error. And I'll, I'll show you where this bound comes from. Um, so to start off with, what we want to do is first show that these distance estimates, in fact, con converge. And so first, we want to say that, well, for every pair of rows, there's sufficiently many common observations. Uh, and the number of common observations, so here I'm denoting n as the, num as the columns for which row u has observed data points. So the intersection between these is the common observations, and that's simply distributed as a binomial. And so this just follows from Chernos. And next, now, given that the size of this intersection is large, now we want to show that this distance that we estimated here, I just spelled it out exactly. Uh, concentrates nicely to the L2 distance between the two functions. And so the first step from the first line to the second one is just to expand this expression here, this squared, and you get a term that's linear in epsilon, which is Gaussian, which is nice, and a term that's like epsilon squared, which is distributed as a chi squared. Uh, and so if you subtract off the two sigma squared, it goes away. Uh, again, you can show that it concentrates well. And now to go from the second line to the third line also is simple because our latent variables beta were sampled IID. And so each of them uh, is, now you have an average of IID random variables where each one has a mean, and the mean is simply the L2 distance between these two functions. So um, now, so, so then that gives you, uh, that with high probability, these distance estimates in fact converge. 
And furthermore, if the function is L Lipschitz, then not only do you have that the L2 distance is bounded, but that the L infinity norm of these two functions, so the maximum difference between these two functions is also bounded. So now we have that the distance uh, actually concentrates well along uh, what we want. Then the final estimate is simply to average within a ball uh, around similar rows with similar um, values to you. Uh, and all we, we, the, this step here is just arguing that there's sufficiently many points in this ball. So what you want to say is that, well, since we're sampling the, these latent variables uniform on the unit interval, then uh, any point has, for any row, there's kind of a high probability that there's another row and sufficiently many other rows who are similar to this row. Um, and then now, given a bound on the number of, of n close neighbors to this row, you, you can um, put the, the, the previous slide together with this slide, and you trade off, you choose the size of this ball you're averaging over to trade off between bias and variance. So this is, in fact, all of these are standard uh, techniques that none of the te these techniques for this part actually are new. But interestingly, uh, it, it actually provides us a way of showing that we can actually uh, get provable guarantees for matrix estimation for this non-parametric family of Lipschitz functions. So um, as a quick summary, uh, where, what, we, where, what we just showed was that uh, the nearest neighbor method for the, this larger class of Lipschitz functions, additive noise gives you um, a mean squared error that converges to zero with the sample complexity of n to the three halves, poly log n. So something to two things to notice about this slide. First of all is, well, Lipschitz is pretty nice. It's uh, you know, non-parametric, so it's a significantly larger class of functions. But another thing to notice is that actually this n to the three halves looks kind of wimpy next to this n. So here, we're, we might want to ask, well, is this trade-off necessary? And is it something that's inherent to this particular algorithm? Or is it perhaps a, a function of when you're dealing with a more general functional class, maybe, maybe there is some inherent lower bound that you actually need more than linear samples? Um, so I can give you a partial answer to that. Um, so first, we want to ask, well, what's the sample complexity bottleneck? Where does this n to the three halves come from? And it comes from the way that we compute similarities. So recall the way that we, so let's say I had two rows, the rows were users, let's say Alice and Bob, and we wanted to compare Alice with Bob. What we did was we look at all the columns, in this case I'm representing them as movies, and we looked for columns for which Alice and Bob both have data points. Here there's two, two entries here. And so computing the similarity actually required these overlapped common observations, and you can ask, uh, how many, let's say, how many columns do you need this row to have data points? So how many movies do you need Alice to have rated in order to guarantee that with high probability, Alice and Bob actually have commonly rated observations? Um, and you can do some, uh, you know, back of the Allenville calculations and, you know, using the birthday paradox. In fact, that means, uh, it, it, was, uh, it means that the, the number of movies that Alice and Bob have to rate will be on the order of square root n. Therefore, the sample complexity of the algorithm at large will be n to the three halves. So, if, what, so what should we do if the observations are too sparse? Um, this is actually very expensive, uh, and, and potentially why, uh, it, why sometimes when you're dealing with very sparse data sets that these collaborative filtering methods have really run into some trouble. So what, what we'll do next is actually a simple idea which extends this one which is, why don't we actually use higher order data associated to Alice and Bob? So for a simpler notation, in this, in this sparse section, I'm gonna deal with symmetric matrices. So suppose our data was, say, uh, generated from a social network, um, where these edges uh, represent the, the interaction, some, some interaction between uh, these two individuals. So you can consider the graph representation of the data, where, again, the edges represent the data points that you've observed. So now when you have really sparse data sets, then you can have this setting where Alice and Bob have no common friends. But instead, what we can do is look at, well, why don't we look at the friends of their friends and the friends of the friends of their friends? And now when you expand to this larger uh, set of data associated to Alice and Bob, then you can find that, in fact, they do have some common vertices at the boundary. And 
And the hope is that uh, just as the direct neighbors of Alice and Bob carried some critical information that was kind of like a signature of Alice and Bob, we're hoping that as you expand these neighborhoods, even at the, this like, larger distance neighborhood boundary, it still carries some signature of the root nodes, Alice and Bob. And now if you compare these signatures, hopefully that will give us some good signal of the distance. So that's what we want to do. You might want to ask, uh, how, long, how long should we uh, unravel this neighborhood? And so again, by the birthday paradox, we want this boundary to be on the order of screw n. So that means this depth, which I will denote by t, will be on the order of log n over log pn. And then now given these uh, boundaries, what we do to compute this difference between Alice, uh, the, the distance between Alice and Bob would be to compare the product of ratings along the paths to common vertices. So for example here, uh, let's, uh, we can look at the paths from Alice and Bob to this grandma. We would be comparing 2 times 1 times 2 with 3 times 2 times 1. And intuitively why this could be a good idea is because uh, we can see it from the linear algebra itself. So say if I want to look at the direct neighbors of Alice and Bob, I can see it in the data matrix uh, of the rows associated to Alice and Bob in the matrix Y. And I want to ask, well, what's the, who are the friends of the friends of Alice and Bob? Well, you can actually directly read that off from the matrix Y times Y transpose. So every time I'm, I'm unraveling one neighborhood of the, this graph, I'm multiplying by uh, this mat data matrix once. So again, if I want to look at the friends of the friends of the friends of Alice and Bob, then it would uh, be represented by the data matrix Y times Y transpose times Y and the associated rows for, uh, corresponding to Alice and Bob. So if the data matrix Y had an expectation, a singular value decomposition of U sigma V transpose, then this third order neighborhood of Alice and Bob would have an expected kind of form looking like U sigma cubed V transpose. So if you compare the first one with the third one, you see all that happened was a singular values or rate to a higher power. And so essentially, that's what uh, the proof will show, although it's much more complicated than this. Um, and, and so essentially, when you compare the direct neighbors of Alice and Bob, it's as if you're computing the distance, but the difference between the rows associated to Alice and Bob in this matrix U multiplied by sigma versus when I'm looking at the, the T distant depth boundaries, then instead I will estimate something that looks like this, where I again have the same quantity, which is the difference between the rows associated to Alice and Bob in the matrix U, but multiplied by sigma to the power T. So if all the singular values were the, you know, the approximately the same value, so let's say the condition number was really nice, then all this means is that, well, we're just multiplying by a constant, so it's not a really big deal. Uh, if the singular values, ha uh, if the condition number was bad, such that you have large ones and small ones, then of course, once you iterate it in this fashion, then it will focus on the large ones, and so it will create some amount of distortion. Now, if uh, t is constant, then the distortion is also constant. So then it's okay in terms of asymptotic uh, analysis. But when t actually has to grow with uh, the size of the matrix, then uh, you need a, uh, a few more intricacies to the algorithm in order to adjust for that distortion. All right, so we'll, I'll present the algorithm in a little bit more detail. Um, so, to def well, I'll define a few quantities. First of all, let T sub U be the tr breadth first tree rooted, rooted at U. So here, Alice will be U. So T is the, the tree, uh, breadth first. And P will denote the, the path. So P, T sub U, comma V is the path from uh, U to V in the tree rooted at U. And N will be a vector representing, S N sub U, comma T will be the vector representing the distance t boundary uh, of the tree rooted at node u. And in particular, it will have the, the value of uh, this vector will be the product of the weights along the path. So here, for example, n sub u length t of this node v, which is the gramma, is simply the product of the weights along the path from Alice to the gramma. And then s is simply the uh, number of nodes at boundary t. And so um, now, once I've defined these quantities, uh, the way I actually compute distance in the algorithm is to uh, compute this thing that looks kind of like an inner product, uh, 
where y is our data matrix. These two pieces on the left and right are simply the, the distance t boundaries of u and v. And here are the distance t plus 1 boundaries of u and v. And um, so this kind of approximates the, uh, dis the, the, this picture here. And then now given these distances, we can compute the final estimate by averaging over nearby points again. So nothing actually changed in this piece. The only thing that changed was this distance. And so what we can actually prove, oh yeah, go ahead. I have questions about the algorithm. What's the inclusion behind the quantities n and n? Sorry? What's the inclusion behind the quantities n and n? Ah, yes, okay. So S is simply tracking the number of nodes at distance t. And the reason why we want to uh, track that is because um, when we're analyzing, we want to show some concentration and some nice properties of this neighborhood as it grows. And what we, and the, the problem you might anticipate is that as you're expanding these neighborhoods, you're introducing more noise, right? Uh, and also more distortion. And so your hope is that the, the uh, the size of these sets also grows fast enough that, that it grows fast enough to kind of um, kill out the noise that is introduced. So we will look at, so, so and, and S, because the edges are set, each of the uh, entries are observed independently with probability P, then it, it grows exponentially. The size of it. And, and, and N is simply tracking the nodes at boundary T, so again, we will look at concentration results looking at how does the distance t boundary look like as a function of the t minus 1, as a function of t minus 2. And so it will give you a kind of way to, to, to look at how do these neighborhoods grow. Yeah. And okay. uh, so, so our theorem statement looks actually pretty similar to the, to the first one. Uh, we as, again assume that the latent function is, is Lipschitz. It's bounded. Uh, we'll assume it's symmetric just for simplicity, but there is an asymmetric version as well. But additionally, actually, to analyze this uh, gr neighborhood growth, we need to assume that the function has this nice spectral decomposition with rank R. Uh, and then, again, our latent features are sample IID. Each end entry is observed independently, and we have independent bounded noise. And again, we can show that with the appropriate cho choice of this depth T, that the mean squared error converges to zero. So um, to give a high level of the uh, analysis, you want to, sh to um, again, analyze the concentration of the growth of these neighborhoods. And in the earlier picture, I said that it almost looks as if you're applying that matrix. You're like multiplying the matrix many times. But really, we're not, the way to analyze it is not exactly to multiply the matrix in particular, but really to look at applying this function as an operator. So, so this function, recall, is our expected matrix. So you can consider the integral operator associated to this function. And this operator uh, uh, operates on mass from functions to functions. And so it kind of captures how does one, um, uh, what is the signature of, say, depth two nodes in the relationship to the signature of depth three nodes. And uh, we can consider the spectral decomposition of this operator, big F, capital F to be uh, represented as follows, where q, k are going to be your eigenfunctions, and lambda your eigenvalues. And we do, again, assume that we have finite spectrum. And now to analyze the neighborhood growth, you can look at the spectrum of f, and it shows up in this way. So suppose I want to look at the expected uh, product of weights along a path of length 3 from alpha naught to alpha 3. Then all I do is I integrate along the two intermediary points. So I can have, uh, so here I'm taking the product of the weights along the path, so that gives me f of alpha 0, alpha 1, times f of alpha 1, alpha 2, times f of alpha 2, alpha 3. And then I integrate along the intermediary nodes, alpha 1 and alpha 2. And the nice thing with the spectral decomposition is that actually this expression just looks as if you take the, uh, the, the starting node, alpha 0, and the ending node, alpha 3, you multiply their corresponding um, uh, representation in the eigenfunction space, and you multiply it by lambda k to the th power 3. And 3 is because this length of the path is 3. So really, um, in expectation, what you're doing as you're applying uh, this function, this operator, is that you're, you're simply, so, so recall that our question was, does the 
distance t boundary of uh, the, this neighborhood rooted at node u uh, ca uh, somehow characterize or capture some nice characteristic properties of the root node. And in fact, yes, it does. And the properties it captures is simply just multiplied in each depth by this eigenvalues lambda. So now to, with, with that kind of uh, and handy, what well, we want our, our distance estimates to approximate ideally would have been this L2 distance between the two functions. And recall when we, we had dense enough information, we actually were able to estimate that exactly. And that, given the spectral decomposition, it looks, can be written in this way. And what we're actually able to show in our algorithm is that with high probability, our distance approximates this expression here. And so if you compare this expression with this one, the only difference is instead of lambda squared, we get lambda to the two times t plus one. And so again, it's the same picture as the one I showed you earlier when we were multiplying the matrices. So the key lemma to showing this is to show that with high probability for all uh, k, so for all of the, these um, uh, eigenfunctions, that when I project my Mm, so recall n was the neighborhood at distance radius t, and I project this vector onto the kth eigenfunction in, in some sense, that's what this quantity. And then it approximates the root node, again u, uh, projected onto the kth eigenfunction multiplied by lambda k to the power t. And again, the, the analysis is a little bit tricky because you need to sh make sure that um, in every step, the noise that you are introduced is, is being overwhelmed by the additional data points that you are also introducing. And um, the key step is kind of to show that if you condition on the S radius neighborhood, when you're looking at the S plus one na radius neighborhood, so the next level condition on S, then this is simply a sum of ID random variables whose mean is exactly the expression you want. So the mean will be lambda times the expression evaluated at radius s. And so once you show that, it's, uh, that this kind of property holds, then you again can apply concentration techniques. And then now conditioning on assuming that this key lemma holds, um, so then, then we can plug it into our distance estimate. So our distance estimate look like this inner product-like thing. And because the expected uh, data matrix has this form, has a spectral decomposition, when you multiply these all together, it, the, uh, it works out well. <laughs> and so in fact, we get that it, the, the mean is exactly what we want. And you can also get bounds for the variance. Thus, you can uh, show concentration by Bernstein's inequality. So now, given that these distance estimates actually in do, indeed do concentrate, then all you, you have left to do is to choose the parameter for the final estimate, this threshold, to trade off between the bias and the variance again. So let me give a quick summary of what we did in this section. So in this section, we looked at the nearest neighbor methods. We started with uh, one kind of naive looking method uh, where you simply look at the difference between two rows by computing the squared difference between common entries. Uh, and the problem, I mean, the nice thing there was actually we were able to get provable guarantees for a large class of Lipschitz functions. But the problem there was that it had a pretty high sample complexity. And so in the second algorithm, what we looked at was extending these methods to sparse data sets, where instead of looking at only one hop neighborhood data, you're really comparing T hop neighborhood data. And that allows you to uh, get a much spar uh, get provable guarantees under much sparser data sets. So here now we're only almost linear in N. But um, in the analysis, I actually introduced this low rank assumption back in. So it's actually quite interesting to think about, you know, is um, it was this a trade-off that we had to make? And we, we don't fully know yet. Um, and is there a way we can actually capture kind of the, the correct sample complexity as a function of the, the complexity of these function classes? So that's all I'm going to say about nearest neighbor methods. And um, maybe I'll pause here if anyone has questions before I move on to the convex piece. Yeah. Um, for the sparse case, would it make sense to kind of initialize with the spectral approach and then draw this into zero sigma? Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Can yeah, you? So I meant like something like a two sigma value threshold. Ah. Instead of the starting point. Yeah. So, so the question was, um, 
you know, would another good approach for this be to simply use singular value thresholding as a starting point to compute, say, use your singular vectors as your latent variables, and then use nearest neighbors to like average over rows or columns with single uh, close. So uh, that that's in fact a, a good suggestion, um, and it's kind of suggested by that, you know, this picture here. That's almost feels like what this algorithm is doing. However, the the um, the catch though is that. Um, so that works when you have uh, sufficient data. In particular, the, um, the regime that that method may run into problems in is in the very sparse data set regime when, um, when your number of observations is, say, less than n log n. So let's say your n log log n observations. Uh, and in, in that case, um, there's, there's some interesting connections that are between spectral methods and also this one, in which they show that when you're in a very sparse regime, um, the spectrum doesn't behave well because the vertices with high degree will dominate the spectrum and they kind of uh, uh, overwhelm, the noise will overwhelm the signal. And um, some approaches people have used to kind of fix it, to try to fix it in the sparse regime, would be to throw away these large uh, degree vertices, um, which cleans up the spectrum a bit. So one way to understand how this algorithm fixes it is that because we're computing a breadth-first tree, it's actually not the same as multiplying the matrix Y many times. Because when you're simply multiplying the matrix Y many times, you're counting uh, repeated, you're, you're actually ca capturing loops as well. You're looking at walks. And um, it's per, it, there's actually a connection between these loops and the fact that the high degree vertices mess up the spectrum. And so I think that uh, that method would probably work in the regime when n is when, when the number of samples is larger than n log n, but but within the sparse case, it, you need some some adjustments. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so then I will move on to the second part. Great, just on time. So in the second part, um, we'll be looking at the analysis of convex relaxation techniques. So these techniques are almost the, the earliest te techniques that were, uh, try, were, were suggested to approach matrix uh, completion. And um, as Devervai introduced earlier, the, um, the approach is to solve the, this, say, minimize the nuclear norm subject to the fact that the matrix matches the data matrix on the observed entries. So here, uh, P sub omega will denote the sampling operator. So it, will, so, uh, it denotes that I will, uh, it, the projection of the matrix onto the observed entries omega. And again, you can think of uh, the nuclear norm minimization, minimization task as like the L1 relaxation of uh, L0 optimization. And that's because the nuclear norm is simply the sum of singular values, as opposed to the rank is the sparsity of the singular values. So in that sense, the nuclear norm minimization is actually the tightest convex relaxation of rank minimization. So it seems like a reasonable thing to try if you really believe that your matrix is low rank. And, uh, and uh, the nice thing, the nice property also is that you can compute them using semi-definite uh, techniques for sem from semi-definite programming because you can rewrite this optimization program in this way and it's a nicely convex um, and so you can use all your favorite techniques. So in this section, what I will want to focus on is the statistical properties of this um, approach. And it's actually quite nice you can show that, in fact, we can guarantee A, the matrix A is a unique minimizer to this optimization, optimization problem. If A is low rank, if it's incoherent, which approximately means that the information is evenly spread amongst coordinates, and that there are sufficiently many samples observed uniformly at random. So this property of incoherence is actually quite important, so let me spend a little bit of time explaining the intuition. So let's consider what if your matrix A was really sparse, in, in fact so sparse that it had only a single non-zero entry and everything else was zeros. Now the problem with recovering this matrix, given a noisy sample, is that there's a high probability of recovery area because really there's only a very, very small probability that you will even ever see this one. Otherwise you can always see zeros. And so, that's a big problem. So we want to kind of rule out matrices like this and not allow them in our 
analysis. <laughs> um, so how do we get a more general form of, of ca that captures this uh, behavior? We can take a look at the singular value decomposition of the matrix A. So let's say A has a, a singular value decomposition, decomposition of U sigma V transpose, where U is now just uh, the set of singular, uh, the left singular vectors, and V is a set of right singular vectors. And so if these left singular vectors, or the right singular vectors interchangeably, if they were um, simply the standard basis vector, then the information is not well spread out. Because what that means is that for every singular vector, the data associated to this singular vector is only represented on a single row. Uh, and so if these were the standard basis, then you can look at the rows of this matrix U and again, they will look like the standard basis. And so the norm of that will be bounded above by one. But what if the, the mass was kind of evenly spread amongst all the coordinates in the, in the singular uh, vectors? So let's say uh, all, all if, if the mass is evenly spread, then the, every coordinate of the singular vector will have an order of one over square root n mass. And then because, the, uh, because we are, uh, have our singular vectors, then when we look at the norm of uh, the ith row of matrix U, then it will scale as screw R over N, which this is like significantly smaller than one potentially, especially if you have low rank and large N, then this is like teeny. So in some sense, what this is saying is that, well, if I want to have uh, a, a measure that kind of captures how well is the information spread amongst the entries, then maybe I want to take a look at the norm of uh, the rows of the matrix U and V. And, and if you can guarantee that the mass is evenly spread, then that means every time I sample an observation, it gives me some information about all of these entries, that, all of these singular vectors I'm trying to learn. So it's kind of a very nice property. And so in um, the precise uh, form of the incoherence conditions, basically uh, bound, say that the, the maximum norm of the rows of U and V is bounded by on the order of square root R over N, where mu naught is a constant and it would be your incoherent constant. So now, um, now if we restrict ourselves to matrices that have this nice incoherence condition, then we can show uh, that Okay, so suppose our ground truth matrix had rank R, satisfied incoherence, and additionally, uh, this is also assuming that um, the, the U times V transpose, the entry-wise is bounded. Now, every entry is observed uh, with no noise, so here we're looking at exact recovery, independently with probability P, that the solution to the nuclear norm minimization task is unique and equal to A with high probability. So that's actually quite a nice property. And let's try to take a look to understand um, how does this property arise from the geometry of this uh, uh, optimization problem. So let's take a look at our optimization problem more carefully. We're minimizing the nuclear norm subject to matching the observations uh, that we saw. And we're going to let a hat denote the minimizer. So uh, a hat is, is the minimizer. And because the matrix A itself is feasible, so uh, the nuclear norm of A hat has to be bounded above by the nuclear norm of A. So we can write the Lagrangian dual. Um, say we put these constraints into the objective function and we introduce Lagrange multipliers for each of these constraints. And now because this matrix, let's say for every feasible matrix Z, so feasible meaning that it exactly matches the value of A on the observed entries omega, then this term on the right will be zero such that the Lagrangian actually evaluates the nuclear norm of Z itself. So that uh, leads to, to the fact that the, the, uh, the solution to the, the value of the primal problem, here this is the primal, is bounded below by the value to, of the dual optimization problem. And here I've defined the dual optimization problem as maximizing these Lagrange multipliers lambda, and minimizing Z of the Lagrange, uh, Lagrangian dual. And we can rewrite this um, just by relabeling the, the variables a little bit. So let's z be a plus delta. So we'll let delta kind of denote the perturbation away from this ground truth. And um, so then that gets us a form like this. So we can rewrite the sum on the right as the inner product between two matrices, 
where this matrix lambda uh, only is supported on uh, the omega, and it's because this matrix lambda is capturing our Lagrange multipliers. We only have Lagrange multipliers for entries in omega, so that's where this constraint comes from. So once we have uh, the setup like this, then we can write this condition. So suppose there was, uh, there existed some feasible lambda, so feasible meaning that it satisfies this condition, so some set of Lagrange multipliers such that for all delta, uh, this, uh, the, the objective function of the dual is lower bounded by the nuclear norm of A. Well, why is that nice? Well, that would imply that the the value of the dual is lower bounded by the nuclear norm of A, but we have that the value of the dual is upper bounded by the value of the primal, and the value of the primal is upper bounded by the nuclear norm of A. So actually that means that, you know, it, that there's no duality gap, and that therefore the, the value um, of the, the minimizer of the primal problem, the, this uh, nuclear norm of A hat, has to equal the nuclear norm of A. And because A is feasible, then also that means A must be a minimizer. So, um, this, so the existence of this lambda is, so this lambda is called a dual certificate because it gives you kind of a certificate that says oh, uh, that as long as I show this, this such a lambda exists, then indeed A must be a minimizer. And there's um, some, another co more convenient representation for these, this, the condition for the dual certificate, uh, which I'll introduce here. So here, the first line, I've simply just copied the inequality from the previous side. And in the second line, all I did was I took the inner product and I split it into two pieces. Um, and so now I can say, well, I can rewrite the dual certificate condition as, a, so I want to find some lambda such that the inner product with lambda with A is the nuclear norm of A, and that would guarantee that this, can, this expression cancels out this one. And also, I want the spectral radius of lambda to be less than or equal to one. And because the inner product of two matrices is bounded above by the spectral radius of the one times the nuclear norm of the other, then as long as the spectral radius of lambda is less than or equal to one, then I can guarantee that this top inequality also hold, therefore lambda must be a dual certificate. And another convenient representation is by introducing this uh, linear space T. So if let's let T denote the linear space that's spanned by the left singular vectors U multiplied by any arbitrary vector X, and the uh, right singular vectors v multiplied by any, singular, uh, any vector y. So t is just the space that's spanned essentially by the left and right singular vectors of matrix A. Then in fact, uh, these two conditions are exactly equivalent to these two conditions. So p sub t uh, denotes the orthogonal projection of a matrix onto the space t. And this operator p sub t perp denotes the orthogonal projection of the matrix onto the space orthogonal to t. So the conditions now become equivalent to saying that I'm looking for a lambda matrix, which again, recall that the lambda was only allowed to be supported on omega, uh, such that the projection onto the space T was equal to UV transpose. And that actually implies that the, nuclear, that the inner product with A actually equals the nuclear norm of A. And also I want the spectral radius of lambda projected onto the space orthogonal to T to be less than or equal to one which implies the second condition that the spectral radius of lambda is less than or equal to one. And um, it just turns out that this will be a, a nice representation we'll see later. So, so great, so we have a set of conditions and all, and all I need to do is say, well, can we find some dual certificate that satisfies it? But actually, one thing that we're missing still is I guaranteed A is a minimizer, but I didn't say it was unique, right? So to, to get uniqueness, you actually need one more, uh, two more assumptions. So one is that you actually need this condition, this inequality to be strict. So we need the um, projection of lambda onto the space orthogonal to T to be strictly less than one. And we also need um, the, the sampling operator P omega restricted to uh, T, to elements in T, to be injective. Injective, so it, no two points map to the same value. Now if you have these two additional assumptions, then A will be a unique minimizer. And, and we can actually show how this follows um, using a, a sequence of steps. So I'll just show it here. So, so here's the lemma we want, to, we want to prove. If there exists some lambda which satisfies these three, con these three conditions such that it's only supported on omega, the projection onto T is UV transpose, and the projection onto T, uh, the, the space orthogonal to T has spectral radius bounded by, uh, strictly bounded by one, 
the and you have that the sampling operator restricted to T is injective, then A must be the unique minimizer. And so how to show this is we can say, well, so suppose that there is some lambda satisfying the above conditions, then for all delta, such that delta is only supp supported on the complement to omega, then we want to show, essentially what we want to show is that the nuclear norm of A plus delta is strictly larger than uh, the nuclear norm of A. And uh, so recall here, A plus delta, we, we, we needed this condition because we're only looking in the feasible space. So since we need our matrix to exactly match on this, the points omega, we're only allowed to perturb A on the points outside of omega. So, uh, all right, so this first step uh, just follows from the fact that, let's say, this, inequal, th this inner product is zero because um, our dual certificate lambda was supported on omega and delta is supported on omega complement. And this term on the left, let's say I'm going to define uh, construct, oops, sorry, this is supposed to be u perp and v perp. Um, these, these are um, ortho, or, so these two matrices are orthogonal to u and v. And you can think of these two matrices as kind of completing the basis uh, of u and v. And, and, um, and so this inequality follows from the, the, the uh, variational characterization of nuclear norm, where you have the nuclear norm is, will be bounded below by the inner product with any matrix that has spectral radius less than or equal to one. And now the next step, uh, by, we can, by construction, well, not yet by construction, but, so we can have uh, U V transpose inner product with A is equal to the nuclear norm of A, so that's where this piece comes from, and inner product with the, this, this space is perpendicular to U and V will be zero. And then the second piece here, we're just simply splitting this uh, inner product into the part that is projected onto uh, T and the part that's projected onto the space orthogonal to T. And so because of our, uh, the w because of our assumption that the dual certificate satisfied this first condition, uh, then this expression goes to zero. Um, and because we can actually choose any uh, u perp and v perp that kind of completes the basis, we can choose the one such that the inner product with delta uh, projected onto the space orthogonal to t is equal to the nuclear norm itself. So that gets us that this time, the inner product between this one and this one is equal to the nuclear norm. And the second part, again, comes from the fact that the inner product is bounded by the spectral radius times the nuclear norm. And now we can combine these two expressions to this one. And now, uh, to finish it off, we show that, well, if, if delta projected onto the space orthogonal to T was non-zero, then this, uh, the nuclear norm of that is non-zero. And because of the assumption here that the uh, spectral radius is strictly less than one, then this expression is strictly positive, such that the nuclear norm of A plus delta, so this perturbation along the feasible space, has to be strictly larger than the nuclear norm of A. And the second case we need to deal with is, uh, so what if the delta now projected onto the space orthogonal to T is actually equal to zero, then it means that delta actually lives in the space T. And because zero also lives in the space T, and that the projection onto omega for delta and zero are both zero uh, from here, then that, then that implies that delta has to be exactly equal to zero by this injectivity of the sampling operator on T. So this gets so this is the piece that also gets us our uniqueness. So this is why we needed the, both the strict inequality as well as injectivity. Okay, so now we've exactly characterized what are the conditions we need for unique minimizer for A to me unique minimizer. The last step that we need is just to show that with high probability we can actually find a dual certificate. And there's two approaches that I'm going to present for constructing such a dual certificate. Um, so. Uh, all right, so the first one is to say, well, I'm going to set up another optimization problem where I look for a matrix X that minimizes, uh, which minimum Frobenius norm that satisfies this constraint here. And now because I'm minimizing this Frobenius norm and this constraint here is what I do is I take X, I first project it onto the observed entries omega, and then I project it onto T, and I want it to satisfy equal to UV transpose. Then X will uh, only be supported on omega, so, so this uh, condition will be satisfied. And, um, and then because, then, then this constraint is directly enforcing the first condition. And the hope is that, well, if I'm minimizing the Frobenius norm, then hopefully I'm also satisfying the second condition, that the spectral radius is small. Um, 
And so, what you, the, and so the nice thing, I mean, the reason why they picked Frobenius norm is because there's actually a, it's an analytical solution to this optimization problem written in this way. So as long as uh, this operator here um, is actually invertible, um, which actually has to do with this property of injectivity, then the only things you need to show is, one, this, uh, this operator is injective, and two, that that kind of arrow that we hoped that actually holds. So we, uh, yeah, and, and there's a lot more details to showing that, but this is where kind of the concentration inequalities will come into play. Another approach I, um, uh, of constructing the dual certificate is an iterative one. So, um, and it, so in, in this case, we will construct a dual certificate that approximately satisfies the first condition, but then satisfies the second one with a much stricter less than one half. So let's say we'll just start with uh, UV transpose, which is what we want this to equal. And because we're only allowed, the certificate is only allowed to be supported on entries omega, then I project that onto the omega entries. But now I might have, uh, I, need to, I need to update my residual. So here W will represent my residual. So it will be, the residual will be the difference between UV transpose, which is I, the, from, coming from this constraint that I want to satisfy, and the projection of my current iterate onto the space T. And so now once I compute, update this residual, I again add it to the certificate that I'm kind of constructing iteratively. But I ha when I add it, I have to project it back onto the observed entries omega. And now I update my residual again, and I iterate back and forth between these two steps where my residual, my, my, uh, residual is defined recursively like this, and my certificate is kind of uh, piece by piece adding these, um, these uh, the residuals projected onto omega. And the hope is that in each iterate, we're actually making good progress. And so the, um, so we're making good progress such that uh, this condition will hopefully hold uh, without too many of uh, these iterates, and that also we're not introducing too much in the space orthogonal to T. And to show that, you can write the residual at time iterate k as a function of the residual at iterate k minus one. And now if I can show that this operator, it kind of contracts, then that means my I'm like making good progress every step. And to show that this operator actually contracts, you can kind of, uh, it comes from looking at this sampling operator p omega. And the nice thing that uh, this paper, Rec Van Rec kind of noticed was that the probability of failure of the nuclear norm minimization problem is upper bounded by the probability of failure, uh, uh, sorry, so the probability of failure under uniform sampling is upper bounded by the probability of failure under sampling with replacement. And so that means I'm, when I'm sampling the entries, I sample them, I put them back when I, before I sample again, such that I can sample entries multiple times. But the nice thing is that it makes the samples completely independent from each other. And once you get the independence, then you can analyze the concentration of this uh, operator now using nice Bernstein's, you can, Bernstein's and matrix Bernstein's inequalities. And then next step, again, is to show, so, we, so this kind of shows my residual kind of decreases fast, such that hopefully the, my first condition is satisfied, then you want to make sure that the, the orthogonal component is not too large. And again, you can write it as a sum of operators uh, applied onto the residuals. And again, you want to use these matrix Bernstein inequalities to argue that this operator has really nice properties. Mm. OK, so now to give a quick summary and wrap up of, oh wait, oh, one more thing I forgot to mention. So one more thing I want to mention is that uh, all the previous slides uh, were about exact recovery, but actually there's a, a extension as well to approximate recovery when you have noise. So if you, ha let's say you assume additive noise where you, uh, your observations are yij equals aij plus some epsilon ij, and um, the condition we'll need here is that the uh, epsilon squared, the sum of the squared noise terms is bounded above by delta squared. And the nice thing is the noise can be either stochastic or deterministic as long as it satisfies this bound. So for example, the Gaussian, you can say it satisfies this bound with high probability. So then uh, you slightly modify the nuclear normalization problem. So instead of exact constraints here, you just, you just ask that um, your, your matrix, uh, that its deviation from the observed entries uh, is bounded by the same delta squared. And now you can show that um, if A hat denotes the minimizer, then with high probability, the Frobenius norm of the error terms are also bounded. And um, the conditions that you need are all the same as the first one because it leverages all the same proof techniques. And so you also need incoherence and uniform sampling with the same sample complexity. 
So as a quick summary, uh, what, were we, what, what did we show in this section? We showed that, in fact, these convex relaxation techniques are quite nice uh, when, you're, when your matrix indeed is truly low rank, uh, both when you have no noise or additive noise, then you can get, um, uh, yeah, you can, you can either get exact recovery or approximate recovery with n times r log squared n uh, observations. All right, so all of you brave souls who are still planning to stick around till 5 p.m., uh, let's do the last uh, bit of the tutorial. Uh, I'm going to uh, now go to the last approach that we have not covered, which is non-convex. And there are lots of exciting things that are going on here, and that's the reason where we are covering as the last piece. Because uh, in a sense, on one hand, we would like to think of matrix estimation as a case study for non-convex. On the other hand, it was one of the earliest approach that was there. And then I will quickly transition into um, uh, what's beyond in terms of uh, that going from matrix to tensors? Uh, what if the um, sampling error is not uh, sampling is not uniform? If it's not uniform, what does happen? Uh, and of course, as I said, I mean, uh, if it's about statistical estimation, and if I don't talk about neural networks, that will be terrible. So I will talk about one slide on neural network and how one can use that, and what are the interesting th questions there. Uh, so with that. Let me start again. So it's a last piece of non-convex optimization. So just to remind ourselves, right? We've got a ground truth matrix A. Y is uh, observed matrix uh, with a noisy version, and we want to find an algorithm that finds an A hat such so that A hat is close to A. Okay, and uh, all the things in gray we have already seen, and so really it's uh, this piece that we want to talk about. Okay, and uh, there, as we discussed, really. Uh, there's a fundamentally it's a hybrid algorithm. This was the approach that was put forth in the, uh, one of the first papers on this topic by Keshwan Montanari and Oh, and where the idea was that well, first you start with your data matrix, get a good initialization, for example, through matrix matrix factorization, and then from there you do further improvement uh, to get better answers. For example, if your observations are exact, that is, y is r equals to a when they're observed, otherwise there's a missing entries. In that case, you would hope that this further improvement along with this will get you the exact recovery. Okay? And there was, the, there was the point of this second part. And now, as uh, recently, there are lots of interesting results which are trying to argue that for this class of problems, actually, you know, if you start with any, look at any local minima, actually local minima is a reasonably good initialization so you don't really need to do good initialization. You're already, already in a great place to begin with. Okay? And we'll discuss all of these things, uh, again, at a cursory glance, but with some detail that will hopefully leave you a good taste of things so that you may want to go and read some of these papers. All right. So with that, uh, let's go to the non-convex formulation. So just remind ourselves, let's assume that we know that underlying ground truth matrix has rank R. Okay. So then we say, okay, all I want to do is find left singular vectors and right singular vectors, or U we transpose such that uh, U is n by R matrix, V is n by R matrix, and it minimizes this squared error. Okay. And again, this is not, uh, this is not uh, a convex. If V was fixed, of course it's convex. If U is fixed, it's convex, but since both U and V are there, it's a quadratic uh, optimization, and then it's not convex. But then you say, well, uh, maybe this is not that bad, right? Because let's say if I observed everything, and if y is exactly equals to a, what is it? Well, this is exactly what people, uh, when, I mean, we learn in basic linear algebra, right? If I want to get best rank r approximation of my underlying matrix, this is the optimization problem I'm solving. Uh, bank, be, best rank r, whether you think of in a Frobenius norm or in a spectral norm. This is the optimization problem I'm solving. Uh, and if that's what I'm doing, one way to do that, as we all know, as our MATLAB does, for example, is to do some variation of power iteration. Let's find the first guy and then the second guy. And they're all simple iterative algorithms, and they converge really well. So there must be something simple about this. In particular, if omega was everything observed, and then we must be able to sort of, uh, we must be able to sort of uh, solve it or we can solve it. So the question is that if 
omega is not everything that is uh, observed, but a good amount, maybe the same robustness should hold. Okay? And that was the basic premise behind this non-convex approach. That is, without noise and with everything observed, we know it works, so noisy, ver uh, let's say, partially observed version should work, and maybe noisy version shouldn't be too bad. Okay? So with that, again, uh, the approach that was proposed in Keishon et al. was saying that, well, if it's exact, and everything is, ob so it's not noisy, that's the exact version, this y equals to a, and I've observed everything, what do we do? We do singular value decomposition in top, uh, take the top r things. Now, instead, suppose that sort of I'm observing a matrix with partially observed entry, but again, uh, the model is exact. There is y is equal to a when I observe it. Maybe I should do something similar and that will hopefully give me a good initialization. And whatever the noise is there, residual noise is there because of this partial observation, I will clean it out by something like, let's say, a gradient descent. Okay. And that's the approach that has been uh, further analyzed and very well studied. In particular, there's a recent work by Sun and Luo provides a very nice uh, uh, characterization which says that if I give you a good initialization. So your original matrix is A. I give you initialization, let's say, so A is UV transpose. I give you an initialization which is XY transpose, such that XY transpose and A are closed in Frobenius norm, and we'll define it in a second. Then, starting from such, uh, such an initialization in that local neighborhood, actually there is no spurious uh, stationary point, which means that you ran first order method and wherever it will converge, that will be the right answer. Okay. And that was the basic uh, uh, characterization that Sun and Luo uh, obtained, and through that they showed that a sequence of paper uh, that started with Keishon and Etel are all nothing but a special case of this recipe. And for all of them, whether you're using alternative least square gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent, and so on and so forth, all of them will actually find, uh, will follow through the same framework. Now, more recently, Gay Lee and Ma showed that well, as it turns out that if you started with any initialization and you ran gradient descent and you found a local minima, that local minima is actually within this nice local neighborhood already. But since I told you that in this nice neighborhood there is no spurious stationary point, this local minima must be global minima. Okay? Again, so the point of this uh, result was that if you look at your, the matrix that you want to recover, and look at small neighborhood, and if you think of this, con this objective that you have, this is quadratic loss, um, and for that quadratic loss, there is no spurious stationary point, which means all first order method only restricted to that neighborhood will find the right answer. Uh, these guys showed that, well, if you ever found local minima of this, that local minima belongs to that uh, neighborhood. Okay. So which means that all local minima are global minima, which means that you don't need to do initialization. You just start at an arbitrary place and run the gradient descent for that matter. Okay. All right, so now what I want to do is I want to quickly just define this and uh, maybe talk a little bit about this, that how this follows exactly from something we saw earlier today before I handed over to Christina uh, as we were analyzing the singular value thresholding. Actually, it provides exactly what we want. And then uh, I'll give uh, at least one simple, you know, rank one case, what this uh, result means. Okay. All right. So those are the three pieces I want to quickly uh, go through. All right. So again, re remember that sort of before I left, uh, this is the basic inequality that we were looking at. There is y, which is the observed matrix minus its expectation in the spectral norm is less than or equal to square root of m p. And now I'm adding this A max, which is the maximum value of A. In that case, it was minus one, one, so it wasn't there. But now it's, I brought it back in terms of scaling. This is how it would be, okay? Now, these are incoherence assumptions that Christina walked through, because I'm not going to go through that. But because of that, effectively, it, it suggests that the maximum value of A cannot be more than R divided by square root of Mn. So this is an implication of this. And that means that 
this quantity is no more than constant times square root of mp divided by square root of mn. And when I divide by 1 over p, I get this quantity. Okay. So all this says is that my observed matrix normalized by p, and again, as I told you, we'll assume that p hat and p are the same effectively for all practical purposes. So let's assume that you and I know p, and hence we can divide it. So just observed matrix divided by p is a reasonably good estimation of A in spectral norm. But of course, we want Frobenius norm. So for that, we just use, uh, uh, we take the matrix Y, do it, our truncation R, and then do that normalization. Okay. And the reason it's a good estimation, because uh, this is a matrix A, and this is a matrix A hat. Okay, uh, again, this, is, this approximation is because of uh, P and P hat. Now, this is less than or equal to 2 times R times this quantity, and the reason is, well, this matrix has rank R, this matrix has rank R. So, of course, the difference cannot have more than rank 2R. So, that is 2R times the spectral norm of this. Okay, now, I will do simply triangular inequality by putting Y in the middle and using something like this. That gives me effectively this quantity. Now, let's see. This is rank R matrix, uh, which is some approximation of, let's say, Y. Of course, it can't be as good as the best rank R approximation by definition. So that means that I can upper bound this by this quantity, and that leads to this. But hey, we bounded this uh, um, as this quantity here. So putting everything together, what we get is that the estimate, the truncated estimate of A in Frobenius norm scales like R cubed divided by NP. Okay, and so as long as uh, NP is scaling faster than R cubed, got a pretty good uh, approximation. Okay, so that means it's sort of, well, just truncation gets us good neighborhood, and this roughly will define the quality of good neighbor. That is, we are close to original A that we care about, in Frobenius norm. And in addition, I will define good neighborhood by adding a few more constraints. Like, this is effectively saying that it's an incoherent neighborhood, and these are just implications of that. So all I'm saying is that a good incoherent neighborhood is something where Frobenius norm is small, and my left and right singular vectors have reasonably uniform mass, just the way Christina explained. And then uh, the Sun and Luo's result is, says that, well, if you restrict yourself to this incoherent neighborhood and you look at the gradient of the objective that we care about, then uh, if you're away from U and V that you, which you want to actually uh, find, that is lower bounded by this, in this quadratic form. Which means that the only way this gradient is going to stop decreasing, or if you take the gradient step, you will stop uh, improving anything in terms of objective is when x equals to u and y equals to v, as long as you restrict yourself to this neighborhood. Okay? So this is kind of a nice local convexity property that uh, these guys cleanly uh, summarized. And again, all of these results have a large body of work, and there are pieces and nuggets coming from everywhere. Uh, but this is the one that sort of is a recent one that summarizes nicely. Okay, so two pieces, right? You got a good initialization, and you put that with this lemma, you get, the, you get what you want. That is, you get a good initialization, and then somehow run gradient algorithm, you will recover the exactly what you want, as long as you're observing things exactly. Okay? All right, so that was the, the last piece I want to talk in this line is, uh, what if, how would we argue that local minima are near optima. And once you have local minima near optima, and you put it together with this, it will say local minima are global minima. Okay. So here's how it goes. So by definition, local minima for an objective F is nothing but the gradient should be zero, and uh, your Hessian should be uh, 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 a non-negative or uh, positive definite. Okay. And now let's sort of take the simplest version. The simplest version is rank one minimization. So let's, let's assume that's rank one. Okay. And we hope that at least for rank one, we can argue that 
local minima are close to global minima. Okay. So one way to write down the objective is nothing but uh, in this uh, through trace, which is the Frobenius norm of this matrix. And this is the same uh, projection operator that we had uh, Christian had defined, which says that if ij entry is in omega, then uh, mi for the matrix entry retained. Otherwise, it's mapped to zero. It's a nice linear operator. First, let's consider that omega is everything and no noise, as we discussed a few minutes back, for everything observed and no noise, really, we do know that local minima are global minima, right? That's the uh, basic linear algebra. Okay, so why should it be true? So let's just verify that. So this is my objective in that case. If I did the gradient calculation, it will look something like this. And if I did the Hessian calculation, it will look something like this. Okay. Simple calculations. Uh, let's say you trust me here. Okay. Now, if we apply these quantities, what does it lead us to? Well, this equal to zero says that x must be an eigen. Okay, so let's assume it's symmetric. So I'm sorry, I should say. I'm going to assume in this case for everything, matrix is symmetric. Okay. Then this is nothing but my eigenvector. Okay. Now, this is good, right? Because remember, if I'm looking for rank one approximation of my matrix, what I really want is, in this case, my top eigenvectors. So at least first I got it is an eigenvector. All I, I don't know whether it is my top eigenvector. So now I want to use my second order condition to argue that it's my top eigenvector. And let's suppose that sort of x is not the top eigenvector and x star is the corresponding, then since I know that this is PSD, quadratic form is non-negative, uh, I can write that down, write down the, use this quadratic form, leads to this equation, leads to this equation, and then finally, all, since the eigenvalue for this is uh, norm of x squared, since it's not equals to lambda star, this is positive, which means that this whole thing is negative. But that contradicts our basic assumption that this is local minima. Okay. All right. I'm sure many of you, if you know, not all of you, have seen this kind of thing before. Why to argue that why rank one approximation or rank one problem is what we do in uh, basic linear algebra. Now what we want to do is that you want to argue similar thing roughly approximately when we are not observing everything. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, we're back to this objective. Instead of uh, everything observed, now we've got this P omega um, uh, uh, operator, which is linear. And using its properties, effectively, one could show that the first order, uh, the gradient is this, and uh, the Hessian looks something like this. So it's very much what it was before, but with P omega involved here and there. And now we want to argue that, well, if A is rank one, so I'm going to assume further condition on A, because remember, I'm trying to recover low rank matrix with noisy observations. So I'm going to assume some structure on A. And in his case, I'm going to assume the best structure I can, which is rank one uh, matrix. And I'm going to utilize uh, a condition that local minima has these properties and use these properties to argue that the, any local minima is close to this z. Okay. And one thing to remember is that if we have exact no noise, then we are going to use these equations really nicely. But when we don't have exact and there is a noise, what we want is the only way to deal with noise is somehow enough things can, should average out, right? That's the only way to overcome noise or overcome uncertainty. Some kind of law of large numbers in some sense has to happen. Okay? And that means that for quantities that we want to compute, there must be enough random terms adding up. This equation does not have that property. But if I look at these kind of, uh, uh, these kind of inner products, they have those kind of properties. Okay? So really, instead of using this equation, I will use this invariant. And again, this quadratic form already had that kind of property because lots of random things coming into the page. 
So as long as we use this kind of uh, equations, hopefully concentration would help us argue that the type of uh, guarantees we got out of these kind of equations would be there too, but with a little bit of uh, error. And that's how we will show that x is local minima of this is close to z. Not exactly z, but close to. Okay, so let's do that. So here is uh, the first equation, which says that let me take a local minima uh, x and just take the interpret of x transpose uh, gradient of g of x, which is equal to zero. That's precisely this. Now, if I did not have this, this is the equation. This inner product looks like this. Because it's there, and because z is nice, it's not uh, spiky, okay? I would like to argue that this equation almost looks like this is equal to zero, but not zero, almost zero. Okay, and this is some form of concentration. And that leads to saying that, well, the inner product of z and x is at least lower bounded by the fourth norm of uh, x, and if fourth norm of x is large, then this says that x and z are at least somewhat aligned. They're not exactly aligned, but they're somewhat aligned, so it's like a progress. Okay. Ideally, I would like to say that x is equal to z, or more precisely, x transpose z is x squared or z squared, but this is a step forward. Okay. Now, using this, and again, uh, looking at this quadratic form, writing the same thing down, again using the fact that these, these points where there is a noise, there are lots of term adding up, do concentration, in fact, it will reduce to this kind of equation. Okay, if we had exact, then this would be zero, but it's not zero, that's the small error. And finally, all of this will lead to saying that, well, norm of x squared is at least one third, or larger than zero. So it's not a zero, it's something non-trivial. Okay. And once you have this plus this, and you this, use this last equation, it'll lead to, through simple calculation and same type of approximation, it'll lead to the fact that z transpose x looks like x squared or looks like z squared. Okay. So what this means is that x and z are close. Now you use that uh, lemma of Sun and Luo, and putting all of those two things together, you'll say, well, local menu is global. All right, so uh, this is where we are. Uh, this is the final scorecard. Again, uh, there are four approaches we have discussed so far, okay? And uh, each one of them have their own strengths and limitations, okay? Uh, there are two function classes we looked at, like Lipschitz and the low rank. Okay. And then there's a Roughly two types of noise model we looked at, arbitrary noise and additive noise, and of course, for exact recovery, we look at no noise. Okay. And then uh, there are guarantees, which is primarily approximation guarantees, saying that mean squared error goes to zero, or you're recovering the exact things, and these are different uh, minimal number of sample required. Okay. And again, as you can see, depending on different contexts, you might want to sort of look at different things. Each one of them have their own strengths, again, and, and their own weaknesses. And as we have discussed, there are, once you look at this table, you can naturally see where are the holes, where are the lower bounds, and so on. Now, uh, we are like two minutes left from five, and it's evening, and uh, it sort of sounds bizarre that I will go over time. So I don't want to go over time, but I also want to show you a few things. So I'm going to just quickly click through a bunch of slides. And please feel free to catch me after we are done so that others who want to go home, they can go home, and we can still continue the discussion. All right, so what's beyond? Quickly, a lower bound. How do you see a lower bound? Well, so what, very simple lower bound, which says that look at a matrix where you take R, it's a linearly independent rows, and just repeat N over R times. And then this will quickly tell you that you need number of samples that must scale faster than N times R. Okay? Uh, there's a nice computational conjecture, uh, which goes something like this. Remember, we had discussed that stochastic block model is a special case of this kind of things. In the particular mixed stochastic block model, which is like a rank R model for R communities and so on, there the computational conjecture is that even to detect, which is a lot weaker requirement than, let's say, knowing everything, says that, well, we need number of sample must scale like n times R square. Okay? And that is because of the terrible noise. 
Okay? And for example, in this work, what we got is for arbitrary noise, we can n times r to power 5. I think truth is somewhere in between, or maybe this is false, and actually it's just n times r. Nobody knows. And these are great sets of questions. There are versions of these questions that you can ask, and happy to talk to you uh, or Christina uh, at the end. There are lots of open questions here. Uh, look at tensor. Uh, image in painting is a nice example. It's like take an image, remove lots of things, and then apply. This is where we applied just, uh, we took the tensor, we folded it, and applied nearest neighbor, and this is what came out. Okay, uh, looks nice. And the best thing about this kind of uh, example is that I don't have to say anything that it works. You see it works. So <laughs> this is, the, let's say, this is the case where 70% of the pixels were removed, and you can still see the, I still see what these things are like. This is tomato, tomato and something like that. All right. For the tensor case, uh, uh, there's a really nice set of uh, works that are done uh, recently. In particular, the two results, one by uh, Bose, Barak, and Moitra, which uses some of square approaches, uh, which looks for three-order tensor, and then the number of samples scale like this. Uh, there's a spectral approach that uh, Montanari and Sun looked at which requires r times t to power t raised to half, a t-order tensor. Um, if we f take our thing and fold it, you get something like this, which works for Lipschitz function, and hence it's nicer than low rank, but this is not definitely not optimal, and there's a huge gap. So uh, there's a hope to improve all of these things, and um, especially for nearest neighbor method for truly genuinely intensive approach. Finally, as I said, let's not forget neural network. <laughs> so here's a, a simple neural network architecture that you can design by simply thinking about a latent variable model. So remember, this is row i, column j. Okay, right here is ei and ej. So this is just simple representation. And then you're looking for some latent uh, features for each row and each column. So this is like your in, in a, in intermediate hidden layer. And then you apply some function to it. So f of x1, x2, and then you sort of train. And just do the simple neural network. Write down th this just fits nicely into sort of 10 line of Keras code. And with a little bit of optimization with right choice of, uh, uh, right choice of the hidden layer and ReLU as the activation for, uh, I could get to movie lens 20 million uh, RMSC 2.77. Now, if you're keeping track of these kind of numbers, in some sense, what is the difference between 0.77 and 0.769? Nothing, or maybe a lot. Well, 0.76 something is the world record, at least, uh, that is reported in one of the blogs. So I could get to this by just doing unoptimized versions. So I'm sure some of you will be able to get even better. The question is that why are these working? And the nice thing about near the matrix estimation problem, these are very concrete, clean questions. So I think potentially we can make progress for them in the context of neural networks. So it's a good class of question to look at even if you are not interested in matrix estimation and you are interested in neural networks. Okay? And for non-uniform sampling, uh, if you believe that Samplings are done by these kind of things. Well, it looks like either restaurant, to, if you go to a restaurant and you rate it only if it's amazing or terrible, most likely. If that's what you believe and it's not uniform, that's fine. Just think of the probability with which you rate as another latent variable model, <laughs> okay? And then just do two matrix estimation and you'll be fine. Okay, so don't worry about sort of non-uniform sampling. It's just fine. Okay. But if it's adversarially, somebody's going to corrupting, then that's an interesting question. There's lots of interesting work done there, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it's about time I stop. So thank you very much for uh, your attentive uh, uh, listening, asking questions, and I'm a little over time. Our apologies for that. If you have questions, feel free to hang around and sort of ask us questions.